वेलकम बैक टू द चैनल दिस इज ट्रेंडी स्टॉम एंड यू आर वाचिंग अ मूवी on what if naruto was banished across space and time if you enjoy this video please like share and subscribe to the channel now wasting no more time let's start the story after a successful uchiha retrieval mission naruto is condemned by the konoha council and subjected to an experimental banishment seal which is then destroyed naruto and his biju find themselves in another world and time during the reign of pharaoh seti the 1st for 4 years he served in seti's palace and became good friends with princess nefertiti until the high priest Imhotep and Angsuamen, Anak, Su, Naman became infatuated with each other and killed Seti. When Imhotep raced to Hamenoptera to resurrect his love, but Naruto followed them and prevented the high priest of Osiris to finish the ritual. When the bodyguard of the pharaoh, the Medjai, burst into the scene, Imhotep puts the blame on Naruto, stating that he killed Seti and hid while trying to cover his actions by preventing the witness from being revived to proclaim what truly happened. As punishment Naruto was condemned to the home. Die, the worst of all ancient Egyptian curses. Trapped in a state of torment Naruto and Kayubi meet the Egyptian god of mummification and the guide, judge, lord of the dead, Anubis. He knows that Naruto is innocent and of his role to play in the elemental nations, so in the next 3000 years until the cycle of the world allows Naruto and Kayubi to return home, Anubis makes Naruto a high priest, as well as teaching him sealing, using both Uzumaki and Egyptian hieroglyphs. hand to hand combat and weapon mastery the powers of the home die as well as creating the first jackal summoning contract plus army of anubis gara stood on his cage balcony and looked out over his country's vast desert he thought of naruto uzumaki the blonde jerk who was his first real friend in the jinchuriki of the kayubi the last time naruto beat gara and the ichibi was in the chunin exams 3 years ago Later, they would help with a mission to get Sasuke back, who was the last loyal Uchiha. Even though the mission went well, Naruto was not greeted as a hero when he got back. Naruto was sent away by the Konoha Council, who were very smart and had the support of the Toad Sage Jiraiya. The council wouldn't listen to Naruto's arguments or claims that he was innocent. Using an experimental form of fuinjutsu, Naruto and the demon that was sealed inside him were sent so far away from the elemental nations that nothing could bring them back. After the sealing was done, the ring of fuinjutsu caught fire, making a burnt crater that would make it impossible for anyone to recreate and use the forbidden jutsu again. Gara and his siblings were angry that the council had taken over Tsunade's power and said the treaty between Konoha and Tsuna was invalid. However, they would still work with Leaf Shinobi even though they didn't like him very much. Tsunade, Shizune, Konohamaru, Hanada, Shikamaru, Rock Lee, and their teammates are the only ones who aren't Gara has been soon as watchful eye on Konoha and their business since then, becoming case cage. Princess Hanada became a great Hyuga shinobi, and her sister Hanabi became the Hyuga clan's heiress. Even though she used to be quiet and shy, Hanada's heart still longed for Naruto. She could never tell him. She is now Konoha's ice queen, which means Kiba and other good guys like Sasuke can't touch her. The fifth case cage was thinking when his secretary walked into the office with a stack of papers close to his chest. Gara just nodded, which told Matsuri, the transferred secretary, to let Tamari in. Tamari had been looking into the strange thing our sensors picked up beyond the demon desert 2 weeks ago. Tamari walked in with a big folded war fan on her back. Her long blonde hair was still spiky even though it was pulled back into four pigtails, and she was wearing a black kimono with red trim around the edges and a big sash around her slim waist. Tamari began her report by giving a quick bow to her cage brother. Two weeks ago, a small seismic event shook across Wind Country. Using our sensor Shinobi to pinpoint the epicenter of the phenomenon, my team and I traveled for three days and nights that we passed the Demon Desert until we reached our destination. At first, we could see nothing among the desert sands, but when the sun began to rise along the horizon, a mirage of the desert faded away, revealing an ancient city ruin of the likes we had never seen before. Our party expressed the desire to investigate before reporting back to you, but something forced us to turn back. When we got close to the ruins, whispering winds blew around us speaking in a language no one could recognize. Then the sands itself came alive like your power with Shukaku. We exited the ruins as quickly possible before the sands could swallow us. Gara thought about what his sister said for a moment before continuing. Could you verify on what clan may have lived in those ruins? There was writing and drawing on the pillars and walls of the ruin that no clan from Wind Country could match. But I was able to get this artifact before the sand and wind attacked us. Can you make something out of it? 
Tamari asked as she handed him a small black metal box with an octagon shape on the top and bottom. The picture writing on the little box makes Gara turn it around, but it doesn't make sense to him. All of a sudden, he twists the top and bottom of the rectangular sides so that the top opens and a map is inside. Tamari walks over to her cage as he opens the map. The map didn't make sense until I looked at the top right corner and saw a red swirling shape with the words, do not disturb the resting place of the pride and wealth of Uzu and her mother, Egypt. Gara and Tamari looked at each other and decided that the ruins they found are from Naruto's clan, even though Konoha did everything they could to erase them from history. The only people who could help figure out what the writings and seals meant were Tsunade Senju and her new apprentice, Hanada Hayuga. This might help them all come to terms with Naruto's exile. Gara told them to tell Tsunade through a hawk that she and her apprentice were needed and to meet them at the demon desert's edge in a week. Gara and Tamari made sure that their village was safe while he and his group looked into the Uzumaki ruins. After a week. Edge of Demon Desert. In their tents, Gara, Tamari, and a few Anbu waited for their leaf helpers. Konkuro took care of Suna and its people. They didn't have to wait long because Tsunade's blonde hair could be seen over the sand dunes. Hanada, Shizun, Anko, and other girls followed her as she went toward the case cages group. Asuma Serutobi, Jiraiya, Kiba Inazuka, Sasuke Uchiha, and the bandaged warhawk Danzo Shimura, along with some other root members, walked past Tsunade and her Anbu guards. This made Gara angry. Hello, Kei's Cage. Thank you for sending us to find secrets that the Uzumaki didn't want their enemies from the Second Shinobi War to know, Danzo said. The Hokage caught up and laughed at her advisor's introduction. Gara didn't pay attention to Danzo to annoy him in silence and talked to the Hokage of Konoha. Greetings, Hokage. I thought I made it clear that I only needed you, your apprentices, and squad of your trusted Anbu on this archaeological finding. Why are they here? Gara spoke in a monotone tone. We thought it would be best for Konoha that our upcoming Hokage candidate, Sasuke Uchiha, be there while Kakashi fills in for Tsunade. The power will help the Uchiha finish off his traitorous brother and make Konoha stronger, Danzo said, not caring that the question was aimed at the Hokage. He then shows Jiraiya what his job is by pointing to him. The Toad Sage Jiraiya is our sealing expert to help us avoid Uzumaki traps. While Asuma has been reviewing his father's notes in reading ancient Uzumaki hieroglyphs from past transactions between the villages before Uzu's destruction. Tsunade had enough of Danzo's self. Centered. Danzo, while I thank you for explaining the roles of the Toad Sage, Uchiha, and Serutobi, I am the Hokage. The Kei's Cage and I oversee this expedition while you and your entourage squeezed yourself with us. I am part Uzumaki, so I have knowledge on reading and writing present and ancient Uzumaki from my grandmother Mito. Hanada has shown great strides in learning their language as well, while her Byakugan will help us discover entrances and other booby traps. Said Tsunade while Danzo huffed in dis and his group walked behind the joined cages group. Scene change, ruins of Uzumaki. When Tsunade and her team finally got to the ruins, they set to work near the statues of Egyptian gods that had been changed to look like those in the Shinto pantheon. The people led by Danzo began to clear away the debris from the entrance to the crypts below. Kiba was sent to stay with Gara and Tsunade's group as a spy to make sure that Gara and Tsunade's team gets what Tsunade or Hanada find. He was all for it if it meant staying with his fianca copyright e. The Kanoa Council made plans for the Inazuka and Hayuga to get married. That deal went through even though Tsunade was mad that her apprentice was being taken away and Hanada still loved Naruto. The heads of the clan, Sume and Hiyashi, voted against her, so it did happen. The Uzumaki expedition helped put off the wedding, but it would only last for a week before they had to walk back and talk about who owned the necropolis. As Kiba comforted Hanada, his dog Akamaru was more on her side. This made Kiba angry that his pet was loved more than he was. It doesn't matter. Soon, his mate will bow down to Kiba's lead aura. Hanada told Gara and his brother or sister what the statue with the dog's head meant. That is the statue of Anpu, or Anubis as he's called. He is the god of burials, mummification, jackals, and guardian of the dead. He is compared to the Shinigami we know because he weighs the hearts of the deceased on special scales that determine whether a person was worthy or not for the good part of the afterlife, or having their heart, body, and souls eaten by monsters and demons. According to the Uzumaki legend of Hamanoptera, the Golden Book of Sealings is kept buried under the feet of Anubis. Explained Hanada as she and Tamari held Akamaru. 
being a great guardian dog like Anubis and his. Tsunade told Kiba to clean up an old mirror that could reflect light from the sun and moon. She said it would be a surprise when the Anbu was done tying the rope down into a crack in the ground below. Gara and Tamari watched Kiba and Danzo's spying route while Tsunade walked over to her apprentice. They were also waiting for the suspicious whispering winds and swallowing sands. Are you alright Hanada? You are doing quite well as a part. Time archaeologist. Said Tsunade. Thank you Senju. Sama. It's just that after this expedition I will be forced to be the mutt's bride while only my sister, Hana, and Akamaru to comfort me while my heart still belongs to Naruto. Kun. He should be the one I'd marry, not Kiba. I know, Hanada. But at least you didn't choose to be Sasuke's bride, or Sakura would have screamed to be the Uchiha's first wife. I only hope that Naruto finds a way to get back from being banished. He was and still is the most unpredictable ninja. Tsunade gave Hanada a hug while the years of council meetings, paperwork, and Jiraiya's stupidity had made the Senju lose faith in Naruto. But she didn't give up hope for herself or Hanada's sake. The Anbu told them that the area was safe and that it was okay to go down into the depths. Change of scene. Hanada, Tsunade, Gara, and Tamari were already on the ground inside the chamber. To join them, Akamaru had to jump into Tsunade's hands. He licked her softly and then put his nose to her jugs. Akamaru was being a nosy pervert, so Tsunade had to hit him on the nose and drop him. He was forgiven after giving him the puppy eyes that made the girls in the group love him. It made Kiba angry when Akamaru finally let go of the rope. At that point, Hanada cleaned a mirror and put it in the sun so that it would reflect light and light up the whole room. Tamari said, Huh, that's a cool trick. Maybe we can use this method for Suna. It will save electricity and make the nights with the stars more enjoyable for us, she told Gara. Gara liked the idea of having more nights with the stars and moon. Tsunade told Gara and the other Anbu, Oh my, this is the room where the mummies are made. She did this while giving them hand. Lit torches. The group felt uneasy as they walked down an old hallway filled with the sounds of a million bugs. When the noise stopped, slowly walked down the tunnel while Kiba went crazy from hearing so many bugs. Even though he didn't mind Shino and his clan, a past Uzumaki joke had made the Inazuka dogs and clan members very upset by sterilizing and removing ticks. It took more than three days to get rid of all the pests in the clan compound. When they get to the end of the hall and into another room, they see Anubis's human legs polished by stone sitting on top of a big, complicated chest. It was about time for the group to look for the legendary Golden Book of Amun Ra when the wind blew up and words and raspy moans filled the room. As the shinobi got ready to fight the unknown being, the sound came from around the corner of the statue. When they turned the corner, Danzo and his friends were also armed and ready to attack. It was only when Tsunade and her group came around that they calmed down. Tsunade lowered her fists and said, You scared us there, Tsunade. Heim. Likewise. Well it's been fun gentlemen, but we have a lot of work to do. Tsunade said. Asuma yelled, Get off the ground. This is our dig site. Tamari replied, We got here first. As everyone got ready to fight again. Hanada saw cracks in the floor while she pushed small rocks, and a few seconds later she heard them hit the ground. They didn't know it. There was another place to dig if she hadn't used her clan's bloodline. The Toad Sage and Bandaged Advisor would have known about it. The Advisor and his group won't give up this chamber, so we'll have to find another. Follow me, Cages. There are other places to dig. She walks out of the chamber, and Akamaru, Tamari, the Cages, and their Anbu follow behind. He turned to look at Jiraiya. Did the Hyuga see another chamber with her by Akugan? No, I didn't see her tap into her bloodline. Kiba, follow them and let us know what they find, Jiraiya told Kiba. The Inazuka heir then fell face first onto the sandy floor and sand filled his nose. He got up, grabbed a flashlight, and walked down the hallway where he had seen them go, which messed up his sense of smell. As a Uchiha, I will claim this treasure as mine. Itachi will fall at my new power. Sasuke yelled as he wedged a piece of the box together with a big metal crowbar only for Danzo to stop Uchiha from putting them all in danger. Careful now. The Uzumaki were not so foolish in protecting their secrets. Please allow my route to do the work while we gain the spoils since there seems to be no seal trap in place. Sasuke, I think we should listen to our wise advisor and have them do it. Jiraiya spoke up. 
The last true Uchiha laughed as he gave the crowbar to one of the three root members who stepped forward to open the box's center panel. It hissed from the three cracks that were stuck open while the root worked to open it by putting chakra on their arms. Danzo was waiting too long, so he told them to use more chakra. The root worked harder to open the box by putting more chakra into their arms. This made for a very intense scene. He told his three subordinates to use more chakra because he didn't like how little success they were having. After the third command, the panel that was wedged out let out a cloud of dust that covered the three root. Danzo and the others moved out of the way to avoid the cloud. Asuma screamed when they saw what came next, and the others looked scared as they saw the last moments of the root agents' lives. Change of scene. Under the chamber that Danzo and his group said they had dug up, Hanada and Tamari were talking about the ancient Uzumaki method of mummification. Gara was using his sand powers to slowly dig below the statue and steal the treasure that the root group was looking for while Tsunade was playing dice with the Anbu. Along with Hanada and Tamari, Akamaru stayed by their side, worried about his lost partner. Tsunade made snake eyes, but she wasn't sure if that meant danger or hope. Gara dug slowly in the sand and saw a big box fall from the ceiling as her answer. Oh my goodness, it's a sarcophagus buried under the base of Anubis. It must have been someone very important. Or they did something very bad. Quickly, help me dust off the sand off these hieroglyphs so we can figure out who this is, Tsunade said as the group carefully looked at the writings on the stone coffin. Hanada called everyone's attention when she found a place to write the name, but all that was written there was, he who shall not be named. It then barked to show the shinobi a winged scarab inside a disc that looked like the sun and had rough edges. Hanada gave the big dog a pet for this. Good work boy. You found what appears to be a lock. Unfortunately, we don't have the key that goes to it to open this. Lady Tsunade or I could use our super strength to destroy it, but that will prove to make this dig more difficult to preserve such an antiquity. Temeri's eyes got really big when she felt something. She rummages through her bag and talks about the box until she finds the item. She showed Gara as she opened it and put the lid on the sarcophagus's indented lock. Everyone, except Gara, looks at the Wind Princess in shock, so it fits perfectly. But the moment is ruined when they hear screaming in one of the halls. Gara protects the key before following the group as they run to the sound. When they get there, Kiba is yelling and hitting everything around him. Anbu holds him still so Tsunade can look at him. Something crawls up his neck, but it's not on his skin. After that, it goes away under Kiba's hair as he starts to lose it again. When he gets away from the Anbu, he charges at one of the walls with his head turned toward it. After a big crash, Kiba falls to the ground and doesn't move. Hanada runs over to check on him. She looks at Tsunade and the others for a moment and then shakes her head. Scene change. Hamanoptera at night. I still don't know what could have been under Kiba's skin to make him kill himself. Were you able to see anything, Hanada? Tsunade asked as they waited for Tamari and Gara to join them around the campfire. A little lady Tsunade. All that was left of it was crushed by the Kiba's impact against the stone wall. It appeared to be some sort of insect. But I couldn't tell you for sure what kind. My old teammate, Shino, from Team 8 could tell you. But he has not been heard from ever since Kurinai Sensei married Asuma and left teaching to Yugo. Replied Hanada. Gara and his sister came in right after they were done talking about Kiba's death. Neither did our friends from the other group. Some of Danzo's root agents were. Melted, Tamari said, setting the leaf Kunoichi on fire. Tsunade asked how. Salt acid. Pressurized salt acid. A simple but deadly ancient trap mechanism. Makes me wonder if the Uzumaki really did curse this necropolis so no one would disturb it, Gara said as a wind that sounded like it was whispering passed by. Tsunade wasn't sure. But she knew a thing or two about cursed things because she still wears her grandfather's broken jewel. It didn't kill Naruto, but he was still taken away from this world. Leaving the shard, which was the last thing Naruto touched before being sent away. They heard horses neighing and galloping toward the two campsites, which broke her train of thought. After telling the Anbu to get ready, the cage were ready when raiders in black robes howled and attacked. Donzo's route were the first to attack the people who broke in. They fell off their horses, and some people with guns like Snow, Spring Country shot and killed a few. Sasuke smiled as he killed another raider to show how strong he was as a Uchiha. Shizun picked up one of the rifles that had been hit by something to get a better look at it. 
Then a galloping raider caught her off guard, and she shot him by accident, killing him while she fell to the ground and passed out. Sakura Haruno took Tsunade's sake bottle and drank it all before she could finish it. Sakura. What are you doing here? I hid in the Konoha caravan containers to be closer to my Sasuke. Kun. She said as she drank some more. But when she turned to look at a desert raider on a black horse with a curved sword, she saw another one. Sakura spit her sake in Tsunade's face as she ran off to find Sasuke. That pink banshee made Tsunade want to crush her so badly that she was willing to do something holy. But first she was going to get back at the man in the robes. She ran faster with her chakra and caught up to the horseman. She knocked the horse down so she could fight the raider. It has taken off the man's face mask, showing more of his short, curly black hair, mustache, and beard. He is raising his sword against Tsunade. He has black tattoos on both cheeks and on top of his forehead. When she throws another kanai at the rider who tried to protect his leader, he drops his weapon. The man pulls out his knife and knocks the last kanai out of her hand while she is distracted. The slug sage then punched him in the face with her superpowers, but he dodged and used his strange martial arts to beat the senju's taijutsu. All of a sudden, sand rose up and snagged the man. Gara walked up to the leader of the raiders with sand in his hand. The voice of Gara said in a low tone, stop your attack. The man did what the case cage told him to do, which was to have Gara take off his sands and go back to his gourd. Enough. Ta la. We will shed no more blood. But you all must leave. Leave this place or die. But why? We only came because this place appeared almost three weeks ago in wind country, here in the demon desert. Can you please help us understand how a ruin of the Uzumaki clan came to be left out here? Tsunade wanted to know. What is this demon desert and wind country? Is this not the Sahara that stretches across the continent of Africa? Said the man. Gara told his Anbu to get them a map, and the two of them looked at each other. Perhaps we should introduce ourselves. I am Tsunade Senju. Princess of the Senju clan and cousins of the Uzumaki clan. I am the Hokage of Konoha, leader of the Hidden Leaf Village located in Fire Country. This is Gara Subaku. Case Cage of Suna. Leader of the Hidden Ninja Village within Wind Country. Tsunade introduces to the newcomer. I am Ardith Bay. Leader of the Medjai. We have guarded these grounds for more than 3000 years. It was upon the first days of the tenth month when the earth trembled, and my people and I found ourselves in our charge in a strange section of the desert. But my warning still stands, leave this place and let the spirits of the sons of pharaohs rest in peace. This necropolis is where the Uzumaki clan went to rest. The leaf village had ties to them until they were destroyed in the second ninja war, Danzo said, letting Ardith and the Medjai know who he was, which made the Hokage and the Kaze Cage angry. Therefore, all knowledge and secrets left behind is now property of Konoha. For the good of the village, relinquish their secrets. As he spoke, Ardith's blade was pressed against his neck, and Medjai was getting ready to fight the root core. Danzo smiled because he could tell that these Medjai didn't have as much chakra as trained leaf shinobi. However, it was the case cage who stopped Danzo's plans. Yes, my friend Naruto Uzumaki is still the last living heir to the Uzumaki clan. He has been sent away, but I believe he is still alive somewhere and will one day return to reclaim his birthright. Until then, you cannot claim ownership. As for your people, Ardith Bay, I will take you back to my village where we can talk about how they can adapt to this new world. Tamari, stay with the Hokage and her apprentice and get ready to leave tomorrow. After that, Tsunade and Danzo went back to their groups and got ready to find anything they could tomorrow before leaving Hamanoptra. What they didn't know was that something was moving down below them. Ready to come back to life and kill or destroy anyone who betrayed the Uzumaki clan and their children. After a long day, both teams work hard to find out more about Hamanoptra before they leave late that night. The many layers of the sarcophagus that Team Tsunade found yesterday are being carefully opened. We'll get to that later, though. Now that the salt acid trap is gone and the chamber is safe to enter again, we need to check on Team Danzo first. Some of the last root agents were carefully taking off a box that was a shade of orange with ancient hieroglyphs on the four sides and top cover. The two agents carefully set the old chest down on the sand floor. 
Danzo, Sasuke, Asuma, and Jiraiya gathered around it to see what was inside. The other workers and Sakura stayed out of the way so the men could have this moment of discovery. But just as Sasuke was about to open the chest, Asuma stopped him and read the old Uzumaki writings on the box's cover very quickly. Asuma said, this chest has a curse on it. As Sasuke starts to change under the curse mark he learned from the snake sage three years ago, he says, curses? Uchiha's don't give up so easily. Just look how I use the power that cursed Orochimaru gave me. He didn't get very far because Jiraiya stopped Sasuke from being proud. Sasuke, curses from my former teammate are one thing. But the Uzumaki were feared for their seals and the curses they wrought unto those that really pissed them off. Why do you think Konoha left that abandoned Uzumaki shrine to fall to ruin? Its seals and curses were so strong that nobody could touch it. Not even Danzo or myself. Jiraiya tells Sasuke to show how severe this Sasuke just laughs and lets the curse go back down to his neck. Asuma is asked by Danzo and Sasuke to translate what this curse means. Asuma reads from right to left along the top cover's edges and in the middle, death will come quickly to anyone who opens this chest. There is one, the undead, who if brought back to life is bound by sacred law to carry out this curse. He will kill everyone who opens this chest and consume their organs and fluids. By doing this, he will regenerate and no longer be the undead, but a plague upon this world. The lights went out as soon as Asuma read those words. The wind sped up as it began to whisper, which scared some of the hired help, including Sakura. When the sand got in her face, Sakura ran, and Root followed her. But Sasuke didn't care. He lifted the chest's lid, and smoke covered the other four people inside. They didn't know they were marked. As soon as the smoke cleared, Asuma took a close look inside. By taking off some fabric, a black metal book with old Uzumaki writing was revealed. Asuma pulled the book out of the chest with respect and said, the stories are true. This is the book of the dead. That's it? A book about the trip to the afterlife? What a stupid thing to hide in a cursed box. Sasuke stomped on the box to show how angry he was. Taking off another panel that showed five treasure jars, four of which were whole and one of which was broken. There was a different head on top of each jar. An owl, a man, a baboon, and a jackal. It looked like the broken one had the head of a lion on it. Asuma took the baboon jar because it was part of the deal his clan made with the monkey summoners. Danzo took the falcon because he was proud to be Konoha's warhawk. Because he was so weird, Jiraiya chose the man jar because he thought he was the manliest man there was. The last jar that was still whole belonged to Sasuke. It had a picture of the Uchiha with a similar scowl on his face. Jiraiya led the group out of the underground hallways to look at what they had found at their campsite because he was happy with what they had found. Danzo looked at the book that Asuma kept close to him in secret. Trying to get the Uzumaki secrets that are hidden inside. One of his root agents showed up and told the Senju Hokage's team what they had found in a whisper. They laughed at the idea that finding and opening an old coffin wasn't important enough for the advisor to think about. Change of scene. The excited Tsunade said, Oh, I've always wanted to do something like this on an archaeological dig. As she put the worn, out stylized coffin inside the stone sarcophagus. Shizune, Hanada, and Tamari were also thrilled to be a part of this discovery. They were going to look at the mummified body of Uzumaki soon, while Akamaru was thinking about chewing on some bones. The Anbu watched over the group in case something tried to surprise them. Then Hinata saw that some of the hieroglyphics on the black coffin had been scratched off. Lady Tsunade, look at this. The sacred spells have been cut off. That means this man was sentenced not only in this life but also the next, Hinata told her lesson leader in the group. Well done, Hinata. I'm proud that you remember those lessons I shared with you. That was the only way I could honor Naruto. Kun and his family, Hanada said. For a moment, Shizune and Tamari rubbed the Hayuga's shoulders to make her feel better. Tsunade took the key out of his pocket and opened the coffin with it. Because she was so strong, the lid flew off and landed on the floor, with the empty inside on top. All the women in the room screamed in fear when they saw what was buried alive. The Wind Princess of Suna held the ninja dog while it did a scooby. Do move. After getting a better look at this body that still looked new, they were no longer scared. Tamari asked, is he supposed to look like that? As she put the scared dog down between her legs. No, 
I've never seen a mummy look like this before. He's still. Tsunade said in a low voice. All of them said at once, juicy. He must be more than 3,000 years old. But it looks as if he's still a decomposing. Someone called out, Hokage. Sama, look here. This made the Kunoichi look inside the coffin's top lid. That which they saw made them scared again because of the horrible things that poor soul must have been through. There were scratch marks all over the shell of the lid. They tried to claw their way out with their nails, but they couldn't. Only to write a short message before the dead man ran out of time. Hanada read, this man was buried alive. And this message, uh, death is only the beginning, as everyone stared at the mummy with its mouth wide open. Change of scene. It was getting dark, and the two dig sites were packing up their gear to leave when the sun came up over the dunes the next morning. Hanada was looking at some fossilized insect parts that were in the coffin of their juicy friend. Before they left Hamanoptera tomorrow, their group planned to bury him again. Hanada was lost in her thoughts when she saw Kurenai. Sensei's Fianca copyright struggling to open the metal black book with the same lock as their mummy's sarcophagus. Before Asuma could see her, she quickly turned away and ran back to the campfire, where Lady Tsunade was drinking sake with Tamari, Shizun, and the cat Anbu Yugo Azuki. Since the first day Anko came to Hamanoptera and didn't come back, Yugo has been worried. Anko went to spy on Donzo's team. Lady Tsunade, I found something you should see. Tsunade had Shizun move over while Hinata joined them by the fire to talk about what she had found. From what I could learn, these are the skeletons of scarabs. They can survive for years slowly feasting on the flesh of corpses. A flesh. Eating insect that the ancient Uzumakis used to dispose of dead bodies while the scarabs scavenge off some dead bodies leaving the bandages and bones behind. The Uzumaki also worshipped them since the scarab was the symbolic animal for one of phases of the ancient sun god that was in similitude to Lady Amaterasu or Kami. Unfortunately for our mummy, he was still alive when they started eating him. Hinata explained to Lady Tsunade and those listening. Curiously. So they threw these little grubbers with our dead guy and slowly ate him alive? Said Tamari. Hinata said, very slowly. The group laughed it off because they were still drunk on sake. The group laughed at the idea of putting Jiraiya in a mummy's coffin and having bugs eat away at his precious manhood. Tsunade said, Shore must not have been a popular fellow our mummy friend. Probably got too close to the pharaoh's daughter. Wonder if I should do that to my mega perv of an old teammate if he went too far like our guy did. Shizun asked, Hanada. Chan, did you ever find out why our mummy was punished for how he is now? From what I could make out from the non. Scratched off markings, our friend was punished to suffer the home. Die. The worst of all ancient Uzumaki curses, one reserved only for the most evil of blasphemers. In all my studies, the ancient Uzumakis have never once practiced or performed that ritual, until now. Everyone was quiet when Hanada shared this new knowledge. Tsunade pushed Hanada to keep talking. I believe that they greatly feared the curse if it should come upon them or even their enemies. It says that if a victim of the curse should ever arise, they shall bring about the ten plagues of Egypt. I've never heard of these plagues before. Perhaps if we ever see the Medjai again we can ask them on what these plagues refer to. After hearing such a terrible thing happen to their newly found mummy, no one said a word. After that, they went to bed to sleep off being drunk and tired from work that day. But Hanada only slept for a few hours before sneaking toward Asuma's tent and returning to her group's campsite with the black book she had seen earlier. Hanada put down the metal plates and started looking through Temuri's things for the key. They were both awake, even though Temuri's eyes were closed. Tamari thought to herself, who would have thought that Shai Hayuga would be so brave as to steal from a man's tent and go through another lady's things? She smiled slyly as she opened her eyes and saw Hanada covering her mouth to hide her squeak. The Suna Junin made a friendly sign to show that she wouldn't tell on the Hayuga princess as she looked at the black book that Hanada had taken from the Serutobi with her. When Tamari saw that this book was made of a black metal, she said, I thought the Uzumaki Golden Book of Sealings, the Book of Amun. Ra, would actually be made of gold. It's made of gold, but this isn't the Book of Amun. Ra. It's something else. I think it might be the Book of the Dead, Hanada said as she opened the key and got ready to open the book. The Wind Princess asked, the Book of the Dead? Do you think you should be messing with that? It's just a book. No harm ever came from reading a book except for the Icha. Icha series. 
Hinata told us. Hinata turned the first page, and Tamari agreed with her. There was a short whine of wind, and then the sound of the fire crackling and burning came back. That does happen around here a lot. What does it say? Tamari asked quickly, ignoring the usual winds of Hamanoptera as Hinata read the hieroglyphs in the Uzumaki language. The mummy would be lying still in the catacombs of the necropolis, and her voice would reach them through the air. Not moving. But as soon as Hinata was done reading the old spell, the mummy came out of its tomb. Back to life. Following a deep breath in, it let out a horrified yowl at the state it was in. Asuma woke up when he heard the terrible howl and quickly realized that the book was gone. When he jumped out of his tent, he saw Hinata and Tamari looking at the black book. He wakes up everyone at camp and tells the Root and Anbu what's going on. His eyes are wide with fear. No. You must not read from the book. The Book of the Dead is quickly locked and closed again by Hinata, who gives Tamari the key to hide it from Danzo and his group. When their Anbu were being held by Root agents, Tsunade, Shizune, and Yugo were about to ask what was going on. There were more Root around the Hokage's group when a Root agent in a trench coat with spiked purple hair used snake jutsu to trap Hinata and Tamari. The group in Yugo recognized the Root agent right away as Anko, who had gone missing. Now that Danzo has turned them into drones. As Danzo, Sasuke, and Jiraiya went to get her captured team, Tsunade asked, What have you done to Anko, Danzo? Asuma stayed behind. Now she looks scared, like something is about to happen. You were too quick to promote her, foolish Senju. My root captured her while she was spying on us and I gave her my seal to make her more cooperative to my root training exercises. But the real question now Tsunade, is how did your apprentice open that sealed book? Danzo looked at the Hyuga who turned his sharp eyes. As Tamari tried to get away from Anko's snakes, he looked defiantly at the advisor of Konoha. We won't tell you. Tamari spat at Danzo as she put the bandages on his face. When a bad thought came to Danzo, he kept his cool, even though he was really mad inside. It might have been time for you to become Hokage and hire more root agents. Sorry for all of you, but you won't have a choice. I will become the sixth Hokage of Konoha right now. Danzo slowly takes off the bandages on his face to show the stolen Sharingan eye that has been implanted in his right eye. Danzo, how could you? Tsunade yelled when she realized what it meant for Danzo to have the Sharingan. To defend himself, Danzo said, it was for the good of Konoha. The Uchiha bloodline couldn't wait for Sasuke to repopulate the clan. I took matters into my own hands so that the Sharingan wouldn't be rotting in the graves of dead Uchiha. He was hoping that Sasuke would understand that the Sharingan's power should not be wasted. They didn't talk about how Danzo and his advisors had Itachi kill most of the clan. As you know, you defiled my clan, Danzo. But if you plan to control these women, then everything is okay. Just give me the Hyuga and Suna princesses. They will give me strong children and be good breeding stock for the elite Uchihas. Sasuke gave the two women a predatory smirk. They were scared that they would have to be sex slaves to him and Sakura, who would beat them to show that she was his first wife. Acceptable, since the Inazuka heir had perished during the excavation. Along with Tsunade and several Anbu while Shizune becomes the new head of the Konoha hospital and be processed into root training. Danzo said without caring. Tsunade quickly turned to look at her teammate, who was standing next to Sasuke. Jiraiya. Are you really going to let them kill me? Your own teammate? Someone was making a strange noise, and Jiraiya stopped thinking. I'm sorry, Tsunade. Haim. But Danzo and Sasuke are the only ones who can calm things down in Konoha right now. It's too bad I'll never get to feel your beautiful. -a. The others and Danzo turned to look at the dunes from afar. They saw a dark cloud in the sky that was coming straight at them. The cloud turned out to be a huge group of big locusts that attacked everyone and set fire to the campsites. This kept Tsunade and her group from being caught, so they were able to get away and go back into the underground crypts of Hamanoptera. Along with Anko, Danzo, Sasuke, Sakura, Jiraiya, and other root, they ran into the ruins to get away from the bugs even more. While he knelt in the sand, Asuma stayed behind with only his baboon jar and the locked black book. The swarm didn't eat him, but instead crawled around him, making him ask himself a haunting question. What have we done? Change of scene. A group of roots running away was led by Danzo, with Sasuke and Jiraiya following. Sakura was in last place. When Sakura walked on top of Jiraiya, 
his foot got caught in a crack in the floor, and he fell. Sand got in his eyes as she yelled, Sasuke. Kun. The toad sage slowly got up from the ground after wiping most of the sand out of his eyes. He slowly walked down the dark hallway, which was now lit by cracks of moonlight. The stone walls helped him keep his bearings as his vision got blurry. All of a sudden, Jiraiya heard breathing wheezing behind him. Who's there? Who's there? He put his kanai in one hand and went into defense mode as he turned around but saw no one. Something that was making these strange noises was coming from everywhere, so he turned around again. But then he heard a noise so close behind him that he quickly turned around but saw nothing. When he turned around again, he thought he saw the outline of Asuma, who seemed to be moaning. He turned around and saw nothing when he heard the noise again. When I turned around, the outline was gone. Now Jiraiya was really scared and thought he needed to call up Fugasaku the old toad and his wife. That's when he felt something breathe down his neck. He knew that something was behind him. As his eyes finally got used to seeing clearly again, he slowly turned around. But what he saw was the last thing he would see before the thing grabbed Jiraiya by the face. Getting him to scream in fear. Change of scene. Tsunade led her group down the narrow hallways with a flashlight in her hand. Tamari had her warfan out, Shizune had her senban out, Yugo had her katana out, and Akamaru had his teeth and claws out. It wasn't going to happen that Danzo or whatever made those locusts attack would use them as his next sacrifices. To let them know that everything was okay, Tsunade nodded her head in silence. As the group came to a new intersection, the ground started to shake, which scared them. They were close to Lady Tsunade when they saw the sand start to rise in front of them. Not long after, black chittering scarabs popped out of the top and covered the whole floor, making it impossible for Tsunade's group to get through. As the group ran away from the hungry flesh eaters, Hanada pulled Tsunade back. The large group of them seemed to now prefer living flesh. Yugo helped Tamari push the scarabs away with a flame jutsu that scared the beetles away. Tamari used her warfan and a wind jutsu to do this. Letting the two catch up to the others while the flames went out and the scarabs kept charging for the group. In the catacombs, the group found a huge room with a ledge where Hanada jumped. Tsunade, Shizune, Tamari, Yugo, and Akamaru stood on top of three tall pillars that went down into the dark hole below. The scarabs chattered as they crept up the stairs to reach a different part of the mysterious sand and stone maze. They couldn't fly to get to their old prey. Hanada had her hands on the stone walls around her when she fell through the newly opened back wall. Just as the last scarab had left, the trap door slammed shut. It was too hard for Tsunade and the others to keep an eye on the scarabs to make sure that none of them got stung like Kiba was. After letting out a sigh of relief, Tsunade looked around and saw that Hanada was no longer with them. Senju, who was the last person still alive, hopped over to where Hanada was and tried to figure out what happened. One part of the wall seems hollower than the rest, so she tries to break it open. It's still too thick for Senju power punches, though. The sound of the pink banshee screeching at the top of the stairs tells Tsunade, dang it. Trap door. There's got to be a lever, a button, or something to open this to get to Hanada faster. She starts to look. As Sasuke and Danzo push past Tsunade's group, the sound of scarabs can be heard again. They are running for their lives. In the hallways they just ran through, Tsunade runs behind them and tells them to go. When Tsunade gets to the doorway, she turns around to see Sakura trip and fall down the stairs as the scarabs start to crawl around her and then swallow her up in their swarms. Her screams fade slowly as she tries to kick or wave the bugs away. After a few seconds though, it was too late. The bugs had already left Sakura Haruna's wet, dressed body behind. While she was running to catch up with the others, Tsunade destroyed the entrance so the bugs couldn't get in. She hears Sasuke find Hanada and try to run off with her. That's when she hears the Uchiha yell in shock. Tsunade screams, Hanada. As she and her group get closer to the exit. She was with them when they were all standing in the cube. Shaped room with Sasuke, Danzo, and Hanada close to the scarab. Shaped wall covered in hieroglyphics. When Tsunade and her friends looked to see what Hanada and the others were looking at, they stayed close. Tsunade was horrified, if not shocked, by what she saw. The cursed mummy that Tsunade and her group found stood there with eyes and a tongue that looked like they had been ripped out. Being able to breathe and growl even though he was mostly just bones and bandages. The mummy turned around and looked at Sasuke and Danzo again. 
Then he let out such a loud roar that his jaw seemed to be coming loose. In a stupid move, Sasuke roared back at the thing and then threw Kanai at the mummy that had explosive seals on them. The mummy didn't seem to be affected until he was blown up and thrown against the other wall. Letting the others get away while the creature fixed his body. He was going to go after them, mostly the two men who were cursed and must now be killed, but he could feel a lone killer still in the catacombs, so he went after that person instead. When the survivors got back to the surface, they saw the Medjai, Gara, and a group of Suna Anbu who had come back. They had weapons and were pointing them at them. Fear made Asuma stay on the ground and hold on to his things as Ardith Bay, the leader of the Medjai, took off his mask. We told you to leave or die. You refused. Now you may have killed us all. For you have unleashed the creature we have feared for more than 3000 years. Ardith told them. But Sasuke laughed because he thought he had killed it. Yeah right. I got that thing with my exploding kanai. No way could it have survived that. Ardith steps aside as two of his Medjai drag Jiraiya to them and says, Fool. No mortal weapon can kill this creature. He's not of this world. Still alive, but without eyes or a tongue to talk about what he saw. What happened to him? Did you do this? Danzo asked the unknown Medjai, who he didn't trust. Ardith told them, We saved him. We saved him before the creature could finish his work. You'll leave all the gear before he finishes you all. But Tsunade and her group went to be with Gara and the others. What are you doing, Tsunade? We need to get back to Konoha before that thing kills us all, Danzo said. He then tried to get Sasuke, Asuma, and a hurt Jiraiya back with him. Tsunade said, No, I won't go back to a village that praises more traitors than heroes. I'll stay with the K's cage and his family and help the Medjai stop this evil that we've let loose, and her team agreed. Hanada, on the other hand, was noticeably quiet. Then you will be marked in the bingo book and thought to be betraying the leaf village. Danzo yelled in anger at losing so many possible allies. Where is Sakura? Sasuke asked, wondering what had happened to the first child he had with his wife. She's dead, Sasuke. And forget about Tamari and Hanada bearing your children. Until the Akatsuki are dead and this curse broken, the Uchiha clan will never return. Tsunade said. Getting Sasuke more angry at the Senju. These outsiders won't be able to help us kill this thing. The roots of Konoha will keep our tree strong, and our will of fire will get rid of this cursed being. Danzo replied. He and Sasuke were about to leave with Jiraiya and Asuma when Ardith stopped the Warhawk and gave him one last warning. No Thesa this creature is the bringer of death. He will never eat. He will never sleep. He will never stop. Change of scene. Anko was still alive when the two groups went their separate ways. She got lost in the necropolis's never. Ending maze until she reached the familiar room with Anubis's legs. That scary sound was coming from something, and her blank mask fell off as she tried to get away from the bugs. She now had only her kanai, jutsu, and torch to protect her. She was about to leave when the living mummy got in her way. It made Anko scared again because she was still a newbie root that Danzo had gotten rid of and left to die. She moved away from the statue and knelt down. Now that they have given up on living. After taking a good look at her, the mummy grabbed Anko's arm with his bandaged arm. Cutting it open and letting it bleed as the undead being did some hand signals that Anko quickly recognized. The mummy used the summoning jutsu to call an animal to him by slamming his bandaged hand to the floor. Smoke came out of his hand as he did this. Anko wasn't expecting the animal that showed up. He looked around and saw the animal that had Anko in its grip. It was a black. Furred jackal with a stylized golden color around its neck. At long last. You have returned to your homeland, hi. Priest. Our Lord Anubis foretold that you would be contracted with us and given the necessary tools against your enemies. I am Shirako, the Wind Jackal. I will be your voice and companion until you are fully regenerated, Lord Uzumaki. Shirako bowed to the Uzumaki mummy. Anko didn't understand what was going on at all. Hold up. Are you really an Uzumaki like the Naruto brat that was banished several years ago? The mummy asked Anko. The mummy looked at her and then spoke in an old language that the former interrogator didn't understand. He says he is, Snake Lady Anko Mitarashi. My lord wants to know why you aren't with Granny Tsunade and the other Konoha Shinobi, Shirako translated for his summoner. When the mummy called Lady Tsunade, Granny, Anko's eyes got big. 
In other words, this was the Uzumaki that Konoha foolishly sent away. Anko said to the revealed Naruto, Naruto? H. How? Why? You really lost some weight and have gotten taller, Blondie. Naruto began talking again while Anko waited for the jackal to translate. It's a long story, he says. But for now, he needs to know if you are to be trusted and conserve him until those who took his canopic jars and the Book of the Dead are dealt with. If you choose to serve him, he shall free you from those seal marks placed upon you by the Warhawk and the treacherous snake. Anko literally flung herself at Naruto at what stated. He didn't care that he was thinner and looked like a dead body with no blood on him. A thousand times yes. I will be your servant, your consort, whatever you want me to be. Just please get these sick marks off me. She asked Naruto. Naruto looked into Anko's brown eyes with his blurry blue eyes as he pulled out her tongue to show the seal that showed Donzo's work. Then he spoke in an old language because the seal ink was bleeding on her tongue before it could be washed off. He let Anko spit out the recessive ink and then had her coat taken off just a bit to show her curse mark. As Naruto worked to break Orochimaru's seal, Anko felt pain in her neck and was about to say something flirty. Within a short time, the seal was gone, and Naruto held a thin, white snake. Like spirit that was Orochimaru's soul. The wispy spirit was in Anko's mouth when she was about to thank him. He made her swallow it. Anko learned more jutsus and fighting moves after she learned what that soul had taught her. The jackal then pulled out a mirror and showed Anko that she now had a tattoo on her forehead. It was the mark of the Medjai, which was seen in the Mummy Returns. It was an eye inside a triangle pyramid with a circle on top and two hooded cobras on the sides. The tattoo shone gold as Anko changed into a pretty purple cobra with a red and yellow hood design. Her mark was now a gold encrusted one that everyone could see, A. Eh? And think of our book from Pokemon. Gara and his council are back in Suna with Tsunade and her group. They left Hamanoptera three days ago, and the leader of the Medjai wouldn't tell them anything else about the mummy until they got back to the hidden village of the Sands. Tsunade knew that Danzo would try to get as much power in Konoha as possible while he looked for a way to kill the thing. Without making the spies from the other hidden villages think you were weak. Tsunade asked Ardith, you said you would tell us everything you knew about what we woke up. Please tell us how bad this is going to be. Ardith was quiet for a few minutes before giving in and telling everyone in the Suna council room what she knew. Very well. We are part of an ancient secret society. The Medjai, the descendants of the pharaoh's sacred bodyguards, were charged with protecting Hamanoptera from grave robbers and armies. For over 3,000 years we have guarded the city of the dead. We swore to do everything in all our power to stop the traitor that murdered Pharaoh Seti I. Now because of you, we have failed. Ardith told them. But what if he was set up, Ardith? Sama? Hinata asked, and everyone looked at her strangely for making that possible. What makes you think that man didn't do it, Hinata? Tsunade asked her teacher. She takes out a rock tablet that has writing on it. This was found in the sarcophagus of our mummy. It was written by Princess Nefertiri, daughter of Pharaoh Seti. She saw what happened and had her loyal Medjai bury it with him because she knew that her word alone would not be enough to convince most of the Medjai and the people who believed and trusted High Priest Emotep and the Pharaoh's mistress, Anksuaman. Hanada gives Ardith a stone tablet, and Th Hanada tells everyone about it, though, so they can all know what happened and who the poor soul is. Nefertiri says that this young boy appeared out of nowhere from the Nile while she was bathing. She takes him to her father's doctors and priests because she thinks he is barely awake. Seti learns that the boy is his long lost cousin who came from the mysterious lands of the swirling waters. After helping the boy wake up, they offer him a job in the pharaoh's house, and he quickly accepts. He wanted to be with family he had never met, so he became Nefertiri's servant and learned about the Uzumaki clan he was from. The boy's name meant, Storm of the Seas, so they called him Set, after the Egyptian god of storms and protector of the desert borders. He worked for Nefertiri for three years and became a strong, loyal, and trustworthy young man. He became good friends with both the princess and her father. After a party, Nefertiri saw her father's consort meet with the high priest a lot while Seti was away. It was that night that the princess realized Angsuaman was cheating on her father, and Emotep kissed and touched her. When Nefertiri looked away, Set was watching the scene from behind the pillars. When her father came back and went to see Angsuaman, he was surprised to see Emotep's priests there as well. When Seti I went to confront his fianca copyright E, she looked like she was by herself, 
but the marks on her body were smeared, which meant that someone had touched her. Ong Suaman, who had been cheating on Seti, stabbed him in the back, shocking the high priest from behind. Nefertiri called the Medjai as they rushed to save her father, but it was too late. Set came out from hiding and tried to protect the hurt pharaoh, but he was too hurt. Emotep and his priests ran away, and Set hid again. He watched as the consort killed herself in front of the coming bodyguards, and then he told them what really happened. Later, Emotep stole his lover's body and rushed to Hamanoptera to bring his lover back from the dead, which was against the gods' rules. Set had followed the killer and his priests, with the Medjai following behind. Set stopped Emotep from resurrecting Angsuaman, but things changed when the pharaoh's bodyguards showed up. He blamed the short lived servant of Nefertiri, saying that Set killed Seti because he wasn't given a higher rank because he was royal. Set would have stopped Emotep from resurrecting the witness and then killed the high priest and his followers to hide his betrayal. Because of this, Set had to go through the home. Die. Aerith. Sama, what exactly does the home? Die do? Hanada asked after telling the sad story of Set Uzumaki. Those condemned to endure the home. Dai were to be sealed inside his sarcophagus. The undead for all eternity. For if he should arise, he would arise a walking disease. A plague upon mankind. An unholy flesh-eater with the strength of ages. Power over the sands, and the glory of invincibility. Ardith made it clear for all to hear. Makes me sad that an innocent boy would be forced to suffer forever. Never being allowed to enter the pure lands or live peacefully in his undying life. My student mentioned that the diseases he would bring are called the Ten Plagues of Egypt. What are they? Tsunade wanted to know. Years before Seti's reign, the previous pharaoh made a group of people slaves to serve Egypt forever. But their foreign god chose two of their men to convince the pharaoh to let their people go. The pharaoh was stubborn, and it took ten miracles from the foreign god to get him to release them. The Ten Plagues had such an effect on Egypt and her people that it would be remembered forever as a time when Egypt's powers were weak. These are the plagues that Egypt had to deal with. A plague of locusts that ate the ripe crops. A plague of flies that made the air dirty and hurt birds. A plague of frogs and lice that got into their homes and made the land smell bad. A plague of hit cattle. A plague that turned all of Egypt's water into blood. A plague of darkness that lasted three days and three nights. A plague of boils and sores. A plague that called high. When people heard about the terrible things that were going to happen to the elemental nations, they all fell silent. Tsunade and her group had already been through the locust plague. They only had to worry about eight more. But then Hanada told them something else that made things worse for everyone. I think I know who Set Uzumaki really is. When I saw him alive at Hamanoptera he called me by my name. He then pulled out from his bandages my medicine cream that I gave to Naruto during the Chunin exams. It looked way older, but I'd recognize it anywhere. I think Naruto was banished 3000 years into the past and has returned to punish those bad people in Konoha for what they did to him. The council room was silent when the news came down on their awareness. Perhaps we can meet with Naruto and see what he has in store for Konoha and the rest of the elemental nations. Ardith, are you and your men willing to put your trust in the words of Princess Nefertiri and Princess Hanada? And be willing to work with Naruto if he plans to not destroy the world? asked Gara in case cage manner. Ardith didn't say anything for a while before answering. It would seem fate and Allah smile upon you. The Medjai will protect this world and the innocent from those with truly sinister notions. It will take some time to learn the usage of your combined physical and spiritual powers called Chakra. Case cage, I also request that my Medjai be allowed to meet with this Lord of Iron Country who are fellow warriors of the Blade as my people are in the future. Our combined might will help protect Suna and her people from other conquering nations. Gara agreed with Ardith Bey's idea by nodding his head. Suddenly, the room shook and explosions could be heard outside. It was the Akatsuki here. Change of scenery, Konoha Hokage Tower. At the same time, in Konoha, Danzo quickly took over as Hokage without much protest. The villagers started to wonder what was going on when he came back with only Sasuke, Asuma, and the broken toad sage. When the Akatsuki threat came up, Danzo told the story of how Tsunade had betrayed Konoha and joined Suna in honor of the demon kid that they had sent away to protect it. Danzo told them that they were surprised at the ruins of Uzumaki and that Tsunade and her group gave up and gave in to the case cage. A lot of the villagers were furious that the Senju, who was known for gambling, had betrayed them. 
but some people didn't really believe that Tsunade left Suna willingly. Some of these groups were the Ichiraku family, Konohamaru and his team, and a few shinobi clans that didn't have anything against the Senju's Uzumaki relative and had to let go. They couldn't move their hands. After being chosen as the sixth Hokage, Danzo started adding route training to the training schedules at the academy. People in the clans in the village didn't know that there was a cursed monster after them. That way, he could quietly find a way to kill it before it killed them in the whole village of Konoha. It's been two weeks since they got back, and the skies around the Hidden Leaf Village were cloudy and looked like they were about to erupt with lightning and thunder. Though Danzo was aware of what was going on, he didn't pay attention because he had heard from Jiraiya's spy network that the Akatsuki were not able to capture their cage with the help of these foreigners in Tsunade. He would soon have to deal with the rebellious Senju. When we talked about Jiraiya, Danzo was scared that Konoha's master spy and toad summoner was now stuck in Konoha hospital all the time. That's what getting his eyes and tongue ripped out would do to you. Orochimaru got Danzo's message and brought him a living Uzumaki. He planned to use this Uzumaki to sneak into the abandoned Uzumaki shrine and find something that would kill the creature he thought was after him and the others who opened the cursed box from Hamanoptera. Change of scene. I'm O. P. Umiyu. A. N. If you try to talk without using your tongue, that's what you get. Jiraiya put out his hand to greet his special visitor. Anko stopped Jiraiya from shaking Naruto's hand while he was wearing his black robes and black jackal mask, A. N. Think Emotep's robes and AC Origins the lizard's mask. Anko said in a monotone, Prince Set doesn't like being touched. It's a silly eastern belief of his. Making it look like she is still working for Donzo's route. Shirako lay next to Naruto and watched in silence. I need to pee, Jiraiya says. He reaches for his herbal tea, but it falls to the hospital floor. Anko gets another towel to clean Jiraiya's hands while she cleans up the mess. The pervert laughed as he felt a woman's feature. He had no idea it would be his last. Thank you for having me, Jiraiya. Sama. Prince Set appreciates your kindness. She then whispers something mean into his ear. Uh, and for your eyes and for your tongue. But I'm afraid more is needed. The prince must finish what was started. And consummate the curse which you and the other fools have brought down upon yourselves. Anko then leaves the room and locks the door behind her when Jiraiya starts moving around wildly and screams horribly when Naruto takes off his mask. After a short time. The counselor for Danzo, Kaharu, told him, how will we get Jiraiya to give us the toad summons? Even if he is crippled, if we summon Gamabunta or Fugasaku, they would make it hard to choose a new student to sign their contract. Homura followed behind them. It is for the good of Konoha. Jiraiya will see that even though he can't see anymore. The toad summons are vital in showing the rest of the elemental nations that we are still a strong village with powerful allies. Said Danzo. A nurse who walked into Jiraiya's room screamed in fear and ran out of the hospital past the Hokage and his advisors, cutting them off in the middle of their conversation. He walked faster to find out what happened to the mega perv while being alert. The old war hawk was shocked, confused, and mostly, though he didn't want to admit it, scared by what he saw. They turned pale white when they saw what they did. There was no Jiraiya. Looking like a dried. Out mummy that has been taken off its bandages. There were croaking and hopping frogs all over the floor. Shiraiya's body and the floor next to the hospital bed both had sand on them. The window was open to let in the view of the cloudy, thunderous sky that hadn't let out its rain yet. Danza looked through Jiraiya's body and saw that the toad contract was still there, but the canopic jar was gone. He ran his finger along the contract to call Fugasaku into the room. The old toad of MT. Mayoboku asked, Danzo, what's going on? Where is Jiraiya boy? And why are there frogs everywhere, whistling about curses and death? Since the mummy was somewhere in the village, Danzo was afraid that the thing that had Jiraiya would now come after Asuma, Sasuke, and himself. Ready to attack them from the shadows. But Danzo quickly hid his fear before telling Pa what was going on. Jiraiya has been killed. Tsunade accidentally brought him back to life while we were looking through the recently found Uzumaki ruins in the demon desert. Do you know of anything that can kill the living dead? Danzo asked after cutting out the part where he and the others were marked. Poor Jiraiya boy. Ma's not going to be happy about this. Hum, something that can kill the living dead I don't know anything that can kill something that's already dead. But maybe the old toad sage Gamamaru knows something. I'll let you know. Oh, 
Before I forget, you should probably get these frogs out of here. Before they stink up the place. Fugasaku's last words before returning to MT. Moose. Kaharu asked Danzo, Hokage. Sama, what's going on? Danzo put on a neutral face to avoid looking angry. You will not speak of this to anyone. Or else suffer the penalty. When we were at Hamanoptra, Jiraiya, Sasuke, and Asuma and I opened a chest that left a mark on us and cursed us to be killed by the monster that Tsunade unleashed later. If we do not stop this thing before it gets to us, Konoha will fall. Danzo told his advisors. Their deaths would mean the end of the last few members of the Uchiha clan. We need to protect the last Uchiha and the patriarch of the Serutobi clan, Homura said, and Kaharu and Danzo agreed. While Danzo got ready to speak to the crowd at tonight's celebration, his advisors set up the guards. At night. Asuma was walking around the neighborhood with his nephew and Fianca copyright following behind him while the rest of the people were celebrating in the plaza. Asuma had his things packed. He jumped when he heard doors shut and wind blowing by. Kuranai, who was getting scared and angry that Asuma wouldn't give Konohamaru or her a straight answer, asked, Asuma, what's going on? Why are you so scared? We need to leave Konoha right away. It already got Jiraiya, and it will soon come for me, Danzo, and the Uchiha. I can't let you suffer for my mistakes, Asuma said as he saw a dark, cloaked figure walk out. He turned pale at the sight of the stranger. After being turned a few times, he went for a clear shot to the village exit. But the stranger got in the way, and someone went behind their back to stop them. Asuma was even more scared when he caught a glimpse of the stranger's face. It had a sharp blue eye and scars that looked like whisker marks. The Festival Plaza Folks in Konoha were having fun with festival games and fireworks when they were all told to gather for the 6th Hokage to give a speech. They cheered when they heard Donzo's name, and the Warhawk let himself be praised by them before raising his hands to quiet them down. People were excited to hear what the Hokage had to say, since Uchiha was sitting to his right because he was a favorite to become the next Hokage. My fellow citizens of Konoha. I come before you, humbled that you put your trust in me, to congratulate our success in picking a more suitable Hokage than the disgraceful Senju that abandoned her grandfather's home. The audience screamed and booed at teas. But now, we must punish the Senju for her crimes against Konoha, all those who fled with her. She has taken refuge in wind country with the Jinchuriki of the One. Tail. With Root and our fine Chunin and Junin, we will strike a blow at Suna. Crippling its defenses while we bring Tsunade and her entourage to face trial and Konoha justice. Then we will conquer wind country and become the greatest hidden village throughout the elemental nations. Donzo's words were heard by many eating up the Warhawk's words because they were so excited to show their Konoha pride. Out of nowhere, a scream of pain can be heard in the crowd, and chaos ensues. A big purple snake creeps out from the crowd and into the shadows of the red light district, scaring a few people. A tall bird with a black head and red eyes flaps its wings and flies off to the west, making another noise. A baboon with black hair and a blue scarf on its back. When the earlier cry is heard again, Danzo is suspicious of the animals that are running away for no reason. He seemed to have died, though. As a black, cloaked figure stares at the downed shinobi, the crowd formed an open circle in the middle of them. When Danzo sees that the shinobi, who was Asuma Serutobi, is now a dry, lifeless body, he turns pale. The same as Jiraiya. The figure stands tall so that everyone can see him and takes the black book in the baboon jar. People in the crowd turn pale and scream that the demon is back when they see the stranger's face. To show that Naruto is back from the dead, the figure takes off his hood. Not having much color on his skin and hair loss along his head. He sees Danzo and Sasuke with wide eyes. They are scared to death that Naruto is the monster that is going to kill them. As lightning strikes, Naruto doesn't say anything, and after another flash, he's gone. As fireballs fly across the sky, the clouds turn a light red color. As it fell on Konoha, the leaf village was on fire and falling apart all around them. A lot of the people and ninjas in Konoha were killed or set on fire by the falling rocks as they tried to get away. Danzo body flickered with his guardians and Sasuke to get into the hidden root bunkers below and get away from the destruction. That Medjai was right when he said that the ex demon kid was a bringer of death. He clenches his cane in anger that the resurrected Uzumaki attacked Konoha out of the blue and hurt him. He might need to ask the other, Cage, to help him fight this threat so that Konoha can live on in the future. 
This isn't over yet, jerk. You won't be able to kill me. Danzo swore in silence as he got one of his roots ready to send a message to the other hidden villages. Scene change. Village under the hidden rain. As the last few Akatsuki piled on top of the ghetto statue's fingers, Payne asked, Are you sure this information is correct? Yes, our spy in Suna was able to get out before Sasori and Didera were killed by the Jinchuriki and the Senju Sage. The Kyubi Jinchuriki has returned from his banishment across space and time. But now he is a more dangerous opponent that we don't have a clue on how to defeat him. Or even know if the Kyubi is still sealed inside him or not. Since last I heard, he was bandages, rotting flesh and bones. But I did hear that he attacked Konoha by calling down a firestorm that decimated Danzo and his troops. Pain heard from the black and white Zetsu. The remaining eight people. That's not possible. I know that the Jashin fanboy and I will live forever, but coming back as a walking corpse with no organs seems crazy. Kakazu asked as Hidan screamed blasphemy at this sin against Jashin. Perhaps it has something to do with the ancient Uzumaki ruins that appeared in the demon desert. There is still so much of the scattered clan that we have little information on. Itachi logically added to the discussion. The pain in his voice said, it doesn't matter. The revived Jinchuriki will fall before the power of a god. His angel wasn't sure. But Nagato, he is a part of your clan. And from what our spy could glean from the story of what the young Uzumaki has witnessed, he has over 3000 years to experience unimaginable pain that you would die from. Perhaps we should try Toa. Pain told her, enough, Conan. Don't say anything else. She stopped moving and was quiet. Sad that the only friend she still has has turned out this way. What do you have to say, Madara? Pain asked the member of the Akatsuki. Used to be called Toby. Danzo plans on having a cage summit in a few days time. It will be the perfect opportunity for us to capture the remaining biju and declare war on the hidden villages. The Kyubi brat will be there. I'm certain of it. Said the Uchiha clan's patriarch. As the Akatsuki left the place where they had met, Payne said, so be it. I'll deal with the revived Jinchuriki while you all kill the cages and the rest of the biju. Soon, everyone will know pain. It wasn't often that the cage summit got together. Only when the five hidden villages got together to talk about how wars should start or end. The past and present cages didn't want to meet because they were involved in three ninja wars. Many Jinchuriki had been lost, and the elemental nations were being hit by random plagues. It was a very bad time. Now that he, Sasuke, and his last few root guards were surrounded by other cages of the hidden villages, Danzo had to swallow his pride. Orochimaru, who took Kabuto's body to stay alive for so long, was one of the people Danzo invited to this meeting with them. The white snake was looking at the nearby last Uchiha with hunger. His two siblings were his guardians, and Tsunade, Shizune, Hanada, and Ardith Bay were his guests. Killer B, the Jinchuriki brother of Reika J, and Samui's team were there to protect him. There was a group of people with the Mizukage and the Suchikage Onoki, who was with his granddaughter and bodyguard. While they wait for Mifune, the samurai lord of Iron Country, to start their meeting. Welcome to the fourth cage summit. We are all gathered here today in reminiscent of strange plagues that have been seen across the elemental nations. Lice in daimyo palaces, all water and sake supply in Iwa turning into blood, a meteor shower that decimated Konoha, and finally the moon blotting out the sun during these last three days. I turn it to the sixth Hokage of the leaf, Danzo Shimura, who says he knows what is causing these wondrous disasters. Mifune began the meeting, nodding to Danzo to stand and share this information with the others. There is something that was recently awakened in the recently discovered Uzumaki ruins in Wind Country. This creature is the one responsible for creating and spreading these plagues across the elemental nations. My people and I saw it before the meteor shower rained down on our beloved village. The creature causing this chaos is our former Jinchuriki, Naruto Uzumaki who somehow returned from his banishment that cast him from the elemental nations. Danzo said in a calm voice. When the Uzumaki were brought up, the cages of Iwa, Kumo, and Kiri shook with fear. Onoki was angry because the past was coming back to haunt him because he helped lead the charge that destroyed Uzushio and scattered the Uzumaki clan. Konoha ruined a good chance for it to have his rival son, which made a very angry. The Leafs spies said that they were treated badly by Naruto, but he could have taken Naruto and treated him better. Because her predecessors had joined Kumo and Iwa's attack on the clan, Mei Terumi felt bad about what they had done. 
After living through and surviving the civil war a year ago, she didn't want to get caught in another fight. Then let Konoha deal with him. You are the ones who destroyed the Uzumaki clan's legacy by treating him like an unwanted pet and hiding his royal and cage of a lineage. Even though he's returned as something else entirely, I still believe he is still the same young man that helped me be more than a bloodthirsty weapon. Suna will not help you fight my friend, unless he attacks me first. Gara said while Danzo sighed. Angry at how stupid this young case cage was, he gripped his cane. Then I demand that you return Tsunade Senju and those who have left their home village. They are still supposed to serve the Hokage and protect the Leaf Village. Danzo tried to use his Sharingan eye on the Jinchuriki cage but failed. Using any of his hidden Sharingan eyes was blocked by something, which made it harder to get the other cages to help him. Go ahead, Warhawk. I know that the Senju babe can be a pain at times, but she is strong to make her own choices. And we all think and know she made the right decision in bailing at leading your sinking village. I still owe her for saving one of my own kin the past, so if you want her, come and try. But you'll have to get past me you old fossil. A said as he opened his lightning armor chakra in front of everyone. Mifune told a, please, stand down, rakage. This is a battle of words, not chakra or fists. A reluctantly sat down and turned off the blue lightning that covered his body. That old fossil statement bothers me, but the rakage is right. Why should we kill our shinobi when the Uzumaki only seems to be interested in you, Hokage? Onoki asked. She knew that Warhawk was trying to get them to reduce their numbers so Danzo could take his route and the rest of his forces to attack the other villages. Fools, if the leaf village is destroyed, then the balance of the five nations will collapse. What would your villages be without the Jinchuriki that my sensei's brother gave to you all? Danzo is now losing his cool. A more peaceful village for one. Kiri has had nothing but one bloody war after another because we used the Jinchuriki to force our enemies back. Only for them to die, vanish, or go crazy through something or someone brainwashing them. Kiri will not take part in your against Naruto Uzumaki. Mei declared, seeing what the misuse of the Jinchuriki caused. But I'm still not sure who the mysterious person was that controlled the former Mizukage based on what he wrote in his secret journals when she took the cage hat. Danzo cursed at the weak Mizukage while she stayed out of the civil war to keep her hands clean. He tried to use his Sharingan again, but the cages still didn't seem to be in any danger. That was because Naruto had Anko, Kurenai, and Konohamaru put seals all around the council room to stop anyone from using mind control. When there was a hissing sound and the purple cobra from before showed up, Danzo was about to argue some more. Moving to the middle of the room so everyone can see it. Since Orochimaru was the only contractor to the snake summon still alive, Danzo glared at him. He thought he had lost Anko at Hamanoptera. He asked the sage with golden eyes, is that one of yours, Orochimaru? He licked the female cobra on the lips and said, hum, no it's not. But it looks like a rare type of cobra that I could use for my experiments. The cobra gave Orochimaru a mean look for a moment before the gold mark on her head lit up and she changed into Anko Midarashi, who was now seen to be alive, hot, and taken. She wore a short skirt in the style of ancient Egypt, a purple tank top bra with red and gold designs that matched her cobra hood, a gold necklace with matching gold arm and leg bands that had ancient Uzumaki hieroglyphics and seals on them to protect her and show who she is, and her signature purple trench coat. She didn't have any foot protection on either, but the seals on her leg bands strengthened and protected them. A. N.A. mix of Princess Nefertiri's battle look with Anko's flair and coloring. Anko hissed, I'm no longer your experimental apprentice, Orochimaru. Sensei. She pulled out her golden twin Sei, which looked like Nefertiri and Onksuaman's weapons from The Mummy Returns. What a surprise, my former pupil. Danzo had told me that you had perished within the Uzumaki ruins after their failed attempt to gain more knowledge and power. The pale pedophile chuckled. Danzo signed his root seal in secret to put the recovered Junin down. He was surprised that she didn't shake or fall. Anko smiled like a snake when she saw what Danzo was doing. It was a surprise to many people in the room that Anko said, your root seal and pedo. Sage's curse mark have already been removed from my body. I am free from both of your controls. They knew about Orochimaru's curse seals. She asked, how? My old teammate couldn't get rid of the curse mark, and Jiraiya was the most famous seal master at the time, before he died from the curse. She thought Naruto might have something to do with it. Anko laughed as she thought about how the Mega Perv died. Naruto. 
Kun has had over 3,000 years to learn and master the Uzumaki Fuenjutsu which is beyond what Jiraiya or anyone here could ever accomplish. He sent me here to give you all a message and explain what he plans on doing. When the Uzumaki said they wanted to tell them something, everyone became very interested. Gara and Tsunade hoped that Naruto would not be their enemy. In her heart, Hanada hoped that Naruto still had room for her. Shizun held her crush Ardith Bay by the shoulder while he stayed calm. Well, what is the message? Onoki asked, bored because his back pain was getting worse again. Yes, tell us what the Kyubi Jinchuriki has to say about his plans that won't come true, asked the new voice. Zetsu suddenly appeared from the ground, carrying Pain's six paths puppets, the immortal twins Hidan and Kakazu, and Itachi Uchiha and his partner Kisame Hoshigaki. Madara hid in different shadows while he kept his real pain hidden with his paper angel. What a reunion this is. My old organization that I left behind, created by the former students of my teammate Jiraiya who couldn't even teach them right. Orochimaru said with a smile. One of the paths, Pain, grabbed Orochimaru by the chest and pulled out his soul. He then sent him through the mouth of a summoned head that disappeared when Orochimaru's body hit the ground. Dead. Ah, I wanted to murder my bad teacher, Anko whined. Getting the snake contract from his dead body and then going back to the middle of the room, but not too close to the Akatsuki group. He has been a pain since he betrayed us. Now, tell us where the Kyubi Jinchuriki is, Pain asked in a voice that sounded like Donzo's and was devoid of emotion. Wait, are you really that boy Nagato that Jiraiya praised for having the legendary Rinnegan? What happened to you? Tsunade asked seeing the six puppet eyes that showed strong dojutsu. What happened was between Hanzo and Danzo. They destroyed everything in aim, so I let Pain in. Hanzo was taken care of, but Danzo must now suffer for the harm he caused to Uzu in aim. When Payne said Danzo had something to do with it, everyone was confused. Now that this Uzumaki had lived through Uzushio's fall, Danzo was swearing and sweating. Did he not tell you? Danzo was the one that fed false information to Iwa, Kumo, and Kiri that the Uzumaki clan was growing stronger and wanting to become another great hidden village. He killed the Uzumaki messengers and made it so Konoha could not help or save them. Payne told everyone. Now the leaders of the three countries feel even worse about killing an innocent clan because they were tricked. How could you, Danzo? The Uzumaki clan never meant to cross the line with other nations. They just wanted to be seen and show that they were a part of this world, just like everyone else. Tsunade cried, seeing this as yet another reason to stay away from Konoha. AI did what I had to do. For the good of Konoha. I couldn't let those sea foreigners shine brighter than the will of fire of the leaf. I had to make sure that we kept our Jinchuriki in the village and didn't have any ties to outsiders. We didn't need them riding on our backs. Danzo tried to defend himself, but he did a bad job since everyone was now looking at him with the intent to kill. Too much of Sasuke's attention was on seeing his betraying brother Itachi. He could finally get back at them now. Sasuke tried to charge at the Akatsuki, but Anko blocked his way with poison gunk jutsu, which got everyone's attention. Danzo and Sasuke Uchiha are already dead, just like Asuma and Jiraiya were at Hamanoptra. Nothing will stop Naruto until he kills them and sucks their blood dry for stealing from the Uzumaki clan's graves. Itachi shivered as he realized that Sasuke would no longer be able to save the Uchiha clan's honor. That should be justice enough to satisfy all parties. Naruto wishes that the Akatsuki stop their quest to taking the Biju beasts in order to revive the Ten. Tailed Beast Nothing good will come of trying to control a beast that is older than the Sharingan and Rinnegan. He wishes to bring back the Uzumaki clan but knows that the god of death cannot allow such a massive scale of resurrection. He will be fine having and raising his own family with any females that wish to be with him. Hanada is blushing at this. He also wishes to free the remaining biju without killing the human containers. He will send them to a realm similar to the summoning realms for the animal summons that can only be accessed if the biju allow it for they are sentient beings that can think and talk as we do. There is more than just seeing them as powerful chakra beasts. The Suchikage, the Hokage, the Reikage, and the Akatsuki did not agree with these terms. They were about to say something bad when they heard a lot of people outside. Chanting the name of Naruto. Na. Ru. Tu. 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 
Na, Ru. Tu Na, Ru. Toa. Gara told Ardith, Tsunade, Hanada, and Shizun to look out the window and see what it looks like. What they saw made them feel bad. At the Five Cage Summit, the last people who still lived in Konoha were now together. With open wounds and boils all over their skin. Walking normally, but as if they were under a spell. He wasn't seen anywhere, though. It was Tsunade who said, last but not least, my favorite plague. Boils and sores. They have become his slaves. So it has begun, the beginning of the end. Ardith said. The other people didn't like what he said. Gara tried to calm down the rakage, and Killer B, Tsunade, and the Mizukage all agreed with him. It doesn't have to be the end for all of us. I trust Naruto that he can safely remove the biju from both mine and Killer B's bodies. Without killing us. It would be nice not to have to worry about making or controlling human sacrifices only to abandon them, thinking they are less than human. Never. A Jinchuriki loses their humanity the moment the biju is sealed inside them. They are meant to be weapons of war that the cage can wield. I am the weapon wielder. Danzo was angry at this occurrence. Being aware that the cursed Uzumaki was nearby. He had nowhere to go. The immortal brothers catch Killer B and Body Flicker and drag them away. Pain says, not if we take them first. The Rakage responds as he charges at the person with the Rinnegan while wearing his lightning armor. Pain used almighty push to push them back. Not only Tsunade but also Anko was pushed back. Gara was about to be taken by Kisame and Itachi, but his siblings stepped in to protect him, and an Akatsuki cloud blocked the mage and his siblings from the Akatsuki. It wasn't Gara's sand, though. The sand then goes to Danzo, lifting him into the air as a deep roar echoed through the room. Quickly, Danzo used his Izanagi power to avoid dying. But when he came back, the bandage on his arm was gone. Having all of its eyes cut out and looking like a mummified arm that is breaking up. Because his stolen implanted eye was closed, he couldn't use any more Sharingan. Before Naruto could catch him, he ran out of the room. Naruto didn't need to suck Danzo dry, though, because he had already used up most of his life force. Now Danzo would die a worse death because people in Konoha had turned into zombies and were blocking his way. As the horde got closer, Danzo pulled out his cane sword and said, I am your Hokage. I demand you let me pass. Some shinobi got sick and Danzo killed three of them before the others grabbed him and his sword fell to the ground. The people then picked Danzo up off the ground while he writhed and yelled to get away from them. Putting out claims like, for the good of the leaf. I am the Hokage. And, my name is Konoha. Only to be met with sharpened wooden stakes carried by the infected crowd. Danzo died in the worst way possible. By the people who looked after him like drones. A. N. Picture that librarian kid from the mummy movie. The Konoha drones were then told in their minds to go back to Konoha, leaving Danzo's body behind. After seeing Danzo die, everyone in the council room looked at the sand cloud that got quiet and then turned back into Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto didn't have on his jackal mask anymore, so he looked older and healthier than the last time they saw him alive, before he was sent away. He still had pieces of open, rotting flesh on his neck and lower jaw, though. He bites down on the scarab and eats it after it crawls up his neck hole and into his mouth. It was Pain who said, the Kyubi Jinchuriki, at last. Not upset like the others about Naruto's appearance or the fact that he ate a bug. Pain tried to catch Naruto with his puppets, but it didn't work. He punched one of the puppets in the head, taking it off its shoulders. His strength was as strong as, if not stronger than, Tsunade Senju's. The puppet that drains chakra hid behind Naruto and tried to drain his chakra. However, Naruto had already used his power over Sans, which doesn't need chakra, to hold the other five back. Making sure they couldn't sign any jutsus. Then Naruto closed his hand like Gara, and the puppet that was draining chakra was crushed in his sand cage. Gara gave a smile. Then he turned some of the floor into sand and let the last four puppets fall into the new quicksand. Leaving only one head of the puppet above the heavy, solid sand pit. When Itachi put a hold on Sasuke, Kisame and Zetsu ran away. Everyone was interested in what Naruto would do to the aim god. How is this possible? No one can withstand the power of these god eyes. I am pain. I will save this world. Cried pain. Your eyes are nothing compared to the true gods. They may not be seen much, but they aren't dead. 
Your powerful chakra eyes are just a cheap trick to make people think you are a god, when you're not. Naruto's voice was deep and unpleasant because he hadn't fully healed yet. He held the puppet in place while turning to face Sasuke, who was having a hard time getting away from Itachi. Sasuke yelled, let me go, Itachi. The elite Uchiha clan must survive. But he couldn't use his Sharingan to force Itachi or Naruto to stay put. No. It's time you know the truth, brother. Father was planning a rebellion to take the Hokage's seat while Hiruzen reigned a second time. I knew that the third Hokage's peace talks would not be enough to sway the majority of the Uchiha from preventing a village civil war. I accepted the responsibility that Danzo and the advisors had given me to kill the instigators of the coup d'etat, only for you and those innocents be spared so that the Uchiha clan can be redeemed, and you will slay me for my wrongdoings. But the one calling himself Madara appeared and killed the remaining innocents of our clan and allowed me to join the Akatsuki, fully aware that I would be a double agent. Sasuke, Pain, and Tsunade's group were stunned at Itachi's confession. I had hoped that you would be strong enough to kill me and lead the clan to a better future than the one made by so much bloodshed, whether I was guilty or not. But the will of fire died a long time ago when Lord Third died and Naruto was sent away. Please forgive me for putting so much on your shoulders. He was asking Sasuke, Naruto, and Tsunade. He was sad that Itachi would go through so much to try to be the martyr who opened the eyes of those who only look. As Itachi got ready to kill Naruto with the Chidori, Sasuke growled and smiled as he found a weak spot in his grip. Uchiha is a jerk. I will never forgive you, Itachi. Once I kill the loser, I will make you pay by killing you and everyone else in this room. I will be the new ruler of the elemental nations. After putting Chidori on his hand, Sasuke cut off Itachi's arm and ran forward to stab Naruto in the chest. Itachi is too slow to stop his careless brother, but someone takes the hit for Naruto even though it wouldn't kill him. Hanada quickly used Byakugan to block Sasuke's chakra paths after his hand pierced her heart. She then fell to the ground and started to bleed. Itachi grabbed Sasuke by the arm and held him still, since Sasuke could no longer move his arms. Naruto got down on one knee and stroked Hanada's long, dark blue hair, which made him think of his Egyptian cousin and friend Nefertiri. She smiled when she saw the boy she fell in love with. She was glad he was back. He asked Hanada, why did you take that hit for me? You know I can't die. Hanada coughed up some blood. B. Because I didn't want you to see me as weak then when you last saw me during the Chunin exams. Eo I love you, Naruto. Kun. I have always loved you since you saved me and fought for me all those years ago. Doa you think you can bring me back? I want to help you and Anko in bringing back the Uzumaki clan. Naruto widened his eyes that Hanada thought about him so much like that. He swore at himself for being so blind when he was younger. Naruto used his signature shadow clone jutsu. As he gave Hanada's dead body to the clone, it seemed to come back to life, and the clone body flickered Anko back to Hamanoptera in a swirl of sand. After they left, Naruto walked up to Sasuke and Itachi and growled angrily at the Uchiha for being so stupid. Sasuke looked really scared now. Naruto took Danzo's in his jars and was about to send him to the court of the Shinigami. There was a noise from his little brother, and Itachi turned his eyes shut. Naruto sucked both Uchiha's dry as he fully healed and came back to life. The Suchikage and Reikage were very scared of the Uzumaki kid. The young man was killing the sixth Hokage and the two Uchiha men in a way that the Mizukage found attractive. She licked her lips in a seductive way. Ardith, Tsunade, Shizune, and the Case Cage's family kept quiet and watched to see what would happen. Naruto kicked their bodies into the sandpit and let them sink like Pain's other puppets. Cousin, end this now. No one should have to suffer because you still won't let go of the pain. That makes you know better than Danzo or the other cages refuse to change or see the mistakes and not try and fix them. It's time to make peace. Naruto speaks in a normal way. I can't. There will never be such a thing as true peace. Not if we continue to live in this accursed world. Peace is impossible. Impossible. Hurt cried out. Naruto hit them, and they are still hurting inside. My friend, peace is possible. It can be found when you are in the presence of your loved ones. In a home, village, or wherever you travel. You can find peace when you love someone and they in turn give love to you as you do them. Peace is something found in an individual, before it can then spread to others. Ardith Bay said. 
Shizum's hand was held as the two of them smiled. Tsunade was glad that her long time student had found someone to love and share their life with. Pain did not say anything, but Naruto agreed with the Medjai. It made him think of the words he had ignored for most of his life and how he should have freed the rain village from the storm's grip. His only wish was for the pain to go away. Pain's Rinnegan eyes turned black on his puppet all of a sudden, and it stood still. Naruto and the others were wondering what had happened when a swirling vortex appeared in the air and a man wearing a mask who said his name was Madara showed up. If only that love could last forever. My plan will make it so while I become the new god of this world. As everyone stood guard over the new Akatsuki member, Onoki asked, Who are you? What happened to Pain? Naruto looked bored as he said, The god of aim and his origami angel are dead. The Rinnegan finally returns to its rightful owner. I am Madara Uchiha. Everyone gasped, except Naruto. At the orange. Masked Uchiha, Tsunade replied, You can't be Madara. He died fighting my grandfather at the Valley of the End. The Uchiha then showed off a Mangekyo Sharingan. Even so, Madara said, my body was never found. I now stand before you all to declare war against you, unless I have the Kyubi. Naruto laughed at Madara's words. Is something funny, Jinchuriki? Madara asked Naruto in a mean voice. Yes. Because I no longer carry the Kyubi inside of me. Since I have been mostly dead for over 3000 years, the Lord of the Dead had claimed the rest of the Kyubi inside of me. That was the payment my father had made when he gave his soul and half the Kyubi's soul as a bargain to the Shinigami. Madara didn't mind Naruto's explanation. It doesn't matter. I only need the Kyubi's chakra to bring the ten tails back to life. Luckily, I already have a backup source thanks to the monks of Fire Country. It's the same old pot that holds the one. Tails chakra we stole when Sasori and Didera tried but failed to capture the case cage. Tsunade knew that meant the Akatsuki were responsible for Monk Sora's disappearance. Madara told the remaining cage and the samurai, I have an army of white Zetsu that will wipe out everyone in this world who stands in my way. You can all give up now or face my judgment. They won't give up to you, Obito. Just because I can't pass on doesn't mean I can't talk to the other wandering spirits. Rin Nohara will never really love you because she saw from the spirit plane how you fell into Madara's madness. Not even your moon eye plan can make her see reason. She won't be the real Rin you really want, Naruto told Obito as he took off his mask to show his angry, scarred face. While everyone looked at his Sharingan in the eye he stole from Nagato, Obito yelled, you're wrong. Rin will never know what I did. She will be real and she will be mine. Kakashi won't kill her a second time. Naruto told the cages, Kakashi is already dead. He died in the meteor shower that destroyed Konoha. I will beat you and your army, Obito. And the Uzumaki clan will help bring about a new era for the elemental nations an era of peace that won't destroy the free will of everyone who will ever live. Will you help my clan stop this crazy Uchiha and end the mistrust between us? Obito swore in silence that his backup Sharingan was now going to. Not happening. Although I want to pummel this brat for taking my brother and Yugito away, I will not help you change the way we do things. Kumo is not ready for the changes that you and your clan will make. So after you finish with the Akatsuki, know that Kumo will declare war on you, boy. Get ready for a real fight. The Rakage and his protection team disappeared in a sudden light. Unfortunately, Iwa agrees with Kumo. Our shinobi way of life has been around for hundreds of years, and it's not perfect. We will fight Kumo to protect our way of life. The Suchikage grunted. His granddaughter wanted to kill the Yellow Flash's son right now, but her grandfather stopped her as they ran away. Obito spun off and went back to aim to finish filling the ghetto statue and summoning the rest of his army of plants. Ha, ha, ha. It looks like you have fewer allies and more enemies, Uzumaki. I will come for you with my army at the Demon Desert. See you soon. Naruto looked at the other cages who were still there. What about you? Will you help me, or abandon me like all the others did? Kiri is with you, Uzumaki. San. But we will not have enough forces to handle both Kumo and Iwa after you kill the Akatsuki. Do you have an army to call on? Inquired Mei. Yes, but first I need to bring Hanada back to life at Hamanoptera before going to a hidden oasis deeper in the desert. It's something that came with the tomb where I was buried. Ardith's eyes grew big when she heard that the oasis of AHM share was brought here. But that's what the gods want. 
Gara told Maruto, you have Suna's power, brother. Tsunade, and we will not leave you like you didn't leave us. Naruto smiled and then hugged Gara. Tsunade walked up to Naruto and gave him a tight hug. He hugged her back just as hard. Naruto, I'm sorry I didn't tell you about your parents. But I'm sure you've made them proud. Though Minato's soul would throb a little when Konoha was destroyed. Naruto said, thanks, granny. You should all go back to Suna and Kiri to gather your forces. I'm going to bring Hanada back and go find my army. He then vanished in a cloud of sand. Scene changed. The ritual chamber of Hamanoptera. Naruto came back into the room where Emotep was trying to bring Onksuaman back to life. His shadow clones had made more shadow clones, who knelt around the stone altar. He puts the last of the canopic jars with Princess Nefertiri's organ ashes in place. Anko, Kurenai, and Konohamaru are standing on the sidelines to watch this important event. He turns to them. He asked, is everything ready? Konohamaru said, all set to go, boss. Because they stuck by their boss through it all. Will it bring her back? Kurenai asked. She was now wearing an Egyptian white dress that went from her new gold necklace with a collar to her ankles, think of Nefertiri's dress from the mummy returns when she watches from the balcony. What did Anko say? Of course it will, pretty bird. Our man will use his magic to make our little princess as good as new, maybe even better. She hugged her best friend close, making Naruto blush as they hugged in their new, sexy clothes. Naruto said, okay. Once I get her back, I should tell Tamari. Chan I'm sorry for taking the key from her. He then pulled out the key and opened the Book of the Dead. Anko, who had been hit in the head by Kurenai, said, of course. Why not just have her join the harem, doggy boy? Her wind jutsus and lioness. Like attitude will be great fit for the growing family. That's her choice, Anko. Chan. Not mine. Our main goal right now is to bring Hanada back. She might be the reincarnation of my friend Nefertiri, we'll see. Okay, boys, start chanting, Naruto told his clones, who bowed back and forth while they chanted. As Naruto started to read, the pool of souls that was lying next to them started to move and ripple. As it moved toward the altar, a spirit in the form of a liquid appeared. The Chidori wound healed after it hit the ground and went into Hanada's body. She gasped for air and stood up. But her breasts and rear began to get more curves, and her body began to change. Her hair got longer, and as it got to her tailbone, the ends turned red. One of her nine vixen tails even stuck out. The ends were dark blue, which matched most of her hair. Naruto gaped at Hanada as she came back to life as his clones popped off. Is this question for Hanada, Kurama, or Nefertiri? He asked her. She opened her eyes, which were now purple holes that made her look even more beautiful. I am Hanada, Kurama, and your past friend, Naruto. Kun. People like Naruto and the others were shocked as they tried to ask the question. How? When Kurama's soul was split, the half with your father became its own soul. So the soul that stayed with you most of your life needed to fuse with someone else's soul to become whole. I chose to fuse with Nefertiri's soul, who Hanada is a reincarnation of. Now we can all be with the man we had a crush on. Call me Karanitiri. Kura, for short. The now. Named Kura went close to Naruto, her breasts pressing against his chest. Ura told Naruto, take us to the bedroom quarters. She, Anko, and Kurenai were going to spend, quality time, with their lover. Since Konohamaru didn't want to hear any of their noise, he jumped off to the treasure chamber. Naruto planned to go to AHM share tomorrow to get his army and, if all goes well, another warrior to fight with him. As long as the Scorpion King doesn't kill him first. Naruto got up early the next morning and went further into the demon desert. One shadow clone that had been strengthened was sent to stay with the others while they got ready for the arrival of their allies in three days. Gara came with an army of Suna, Mifune with his samurai, and Mei Terumi with her Kiri shinobi. They met in a big tent to talk while their shinobi, samurai, and Medjai watched over Hamanoptera. Gara was put in charge of their alliance by Mifune, while Ardith and Naruto the clone strengthened the defenses around and inside the necropolis in case they had to run away from Obito's forces and the armies of Iwa and Kumo, who would arrive later. Kurenai and some other genjutsu users made a big genjutsu that hides them for now so Naruto has more time. But Obito Uchiha's Sharingan and Rinnegan are stronger than any other genjutsu. Are you certain you will get your army in time, Naruto? 
Even with your cursed abilities, we are greatly outnumbered in our defiance to the Akatsuki and two great nations. It's already in the afternoon and Obito hasn't arrived yet with his army. Gara expressed his worries to the clone. Don't worry. I already made it to the oasis of AHM Share and am near the pyramid to challenge the Scorpion King. Something tells me that I will not bear the curse for much longer, and I will have to fight him as man. Not as a monster. Hopefully, I'll get to show you one more ability of my home. Die to give us more time. Said Naruto S. Clone as he hugged his worried vixen Kura. She asked, that reminds me, what's the story behind this oasis and this powerful army you're looking for? You never told us much before you lied to us three or when you left early in the morning. Anko, who was twirling her psi weapons, blushed at this. I have some memories on the legend from my past life as the princess of Thebes. But I think Ardith Bay knows it a lot more than I do. Will you share the tale of the Scorpion King, Medjai? Said Karanitiri. I can do that, Princess Kura. Know that this happened, before, the time of Pharaoh Seti I's reign. Five thousand years ago, a fierce warrior known as the Scorpion King, known for having the blood of a scorpion in his veins, led a great army on a campaign to conquer the known world after a vicious campaign which lasted seven long years, the Scorpion King and his army were defeated and driven deep into the sacred desert of A.H.M. Sher. One by one, they slowly perished under the scorching sun. Until only the great warrior himself was left alive. Near death, the Scorpion King made a pact with the god Anubis. That if Anubis would spare his life and let him conquer his enemies, he will give him his soul. The story was now being told to everyone. I was amazed by how strong and ambitious this Scorpion King was. Ardith went on. Anubis accepted his offer and spared his life. That is when the oasis of AHM Share was created. Anubis gave the Scorpion King command of his army. Like an evil flood, they washed away all that lay before them. When his task was done, Anubis forced the Scorpion King to serve him for all time. His army was returned to the sands from whence they came. Where they wait, silently, to be awakened once again. It is said that whomever can kill the Scorpion King, who now resides within a legendary gold pyramid within the oasis, can send the army of Anubis back to the underworld. Or, use it, to destroy mankind and rule the earth. He told the leaders, who were angry about how terrible the army of Anubis could be, I don't plan to destroy humanity. But I will use it to help us fight our enemies and make our peaceful future. All of a sudden, a samurai trooper walked into the tent and bowed to the alliance leaders. My lords and ladies. A great army approaches from the east, but the one leading it is not the Uchiha that appeared at the Five Cage Summit. The leaders looked at Obito with raised eyebrows because he wasn't the Uchiha who was in charge of the White Zetsu army. Gara told Mifune and Ardith to get their warriors ready before they left the tent. The resistance got together and waited. Soon, they saw the White Army coming up behind the dunes. A huge number of White Zetsu, which were humanoid plants whose arms had changed into spikes and other deadly weapons, made up the White Zetsu army. Behind the first 10,000 Zetsu was the ghetto statue, with the rest of the Akatsuki riding it except for Black Zetsu, who was nowhere to be found. The White Zetsu army was marching behind the statue. They were Kakazu and Hidan, two immortals who worshipped Jashin. Kisame with his swordsman of the Mist Sword. Samahata. And finally, a Uchiha with long, shaggy black hair and red. Plated battle armor. When Tsunade saw the Uchiha, she gasped in fear and stood still. N. Noah it can't be. Grandfather killed him. How is he here? Lady Tsunade, what's wrong? Who is that Uchiha in the armor? Spoke to Shizun. Kura was growling as she thought she recognized some of the Uchiha that had been bothering her. That's Madara Uchiha. I recognize that man from what Grandpa spoke of him with his armor, looks, and his arrogant scowl that he carries. But how can he be here? He couldn't have been revived by the reanimation jutsu that Orochimaru used. Tsunade couldn't believe it. The clone of Naruto said, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Plus, it will give you all time to get ready. He then jumped forward to meet the army that had stopped in the sands. Not far from Hamanoptera, its genjutsu has been taken out but none of its other defenses have been hit. While still on the ghetto statue, Madara and the other Akatsuki jumped off to meet Naruto in person. Madara kept scowling at the one Uzumaki with golden hair instead of the usual red hair, but he finally broke the silence by speaking first. 
So, my disciple was not wrong. You are a strange Uzumaki with your hair and unique abilities. I look forward to destroying you. According to Madara. So you are the real Madara Uchiha. Where is Obito? Why is he not fighting with the rest of you? And on another note, how are you alive and kicking at our doorstep? Said Naruto's clone. My disciple went to stop the Uzumaki from claiming his so. Called army, shadow clone. As for how I live again in my prime, the Rinnegan allowed my disciple to perform the Rinne Rebirth Jutsu that restored me to how you see me now. Your small group of fighters are not nearly enough to warrant my power, show me what you can do, Uzumaki. Before I claim the ten. Tails and become the new god of this world. Madara body flickers back up on top of the ghetto statue as the rest of the Akatsuki surround Naruto and the white Zetsu army moves forward. You will die, you blasphemer of Jashin. Hidan yelled as he and his other Akatsuki went around and around. When that Tobi fellow kills the real you, I'm going to collect on your bounty. Kakazu was happy. Kisame told Naruto, Samahada will eat your chakra. Then I will be happy by ending the new Mizukage. Samahada smiled at Naruto. The Shadow Clone only used the home. Dai sand power of his original to throw the three Akatsuki into the first wave of their army. He wouldn't stop there, though. He could now show how strong his grip on sand really is. Naruto roared loudly and raised his hands into the air. The ground fell away from his sides as he called up a huge sandstorm wall. Or a sand wall that went across more than half of the demon desert. The wall in this fight was taller than Gara's sand tsunami jutsu and had more wind power running through it. Naruto moved the sand wall forward as it charged at the first Akatsuki wave. The soldier that looked like a plant turned into sawdust as soon as it touched the first white zetsu. While the rest of them were being eaten by the huge wall of sandpaper, the white zetsu were too shocked to do anything. It was mostly the chakra of the three Akatsuki members that kept them safe, but the power of the sandstorm sent them flying through the air, where they could not do anything making them into puppets that can't move because their strings are gone. But Madara didn't back down. He turned on his Suzano and put his blue samurai warrior over himself and the sleeping ten. Tails. After a while, he notices that the sand wall now has a picture of Naruto's face with a grin on it. Madara is not amused as he uses several fire jutsus that don't do much to move the living sandstorm that is blocking him and his army. It was like a huge war broke out in the sand, and Naruto sucked Madara and the ghetto statue into the strongest part of the cursed sandstorm. The shell that Madara and the ten tails were hiding was getting cracks all around it. Madara Uchiha had to show his secret weapon, the Rinnegan, because he was angry. The sand was pushed out of his huge gravity bubble with a shout of, Almighty Push. The sand wall disappeared all of a sudden, and clone Naruto fell to the ground. His body was no longer cursed like it was when he was alive. Naruto's clone smiled, though, because he gave the alliance a chance. The remaining Akatsuki members were hurt and could hardly stand after being thrown into the rough desert sands. While the alliance kills his pawns, Madara would do nothing but wait for a strong opponent to come and fight. The clone then vanished in a puff of smoke, leaving the Akatsuki to regroup and heal before going to fight the three cage, Medjai, and the rest of the Uzumaki alliance. Change of scene, Pyramid of AHM share. Obito was going to follow Naruto, but he didn't know that the Uchiha, Black Zetsu, and a squadron of White Zetsu soldiers would have to deal with the guardians of the sacred oasis. With their tiny daggers, darts, and sharp teeth, pygmy mummies worked up a storm among the group. After the jackal god blessed the ground, the Zetsu tried to merge with it but failed. They all died. But Black Zetsu stayed with Obito while he used his Kamui powers to make himself invisible so the fast. Tiny mummies couldn't hurt him. As soon as Naruto got to the pyramid, he followed the hieroglyphics on the walls to get to the room where the Scorpion King was sleeping. The pyramid, woke up, when he entered a room that looked a lot like Hamanoptera's treasure chamber, but didn't have as many valuable items. Naruto threw away his torch as the room became lit up and the dark parts seemed to shine with a golden light. But when Obito and Black Zetsu finally got to him, they threw him down the stairs. As a way to deal with the stress that the little cannibals caused him and his army, the Uchiha beat up his sensei's son. Black Zetsu kept in touch with Obito to make sure that the Uzumaki stopped getting in the way of his plans. You're a real pain in the behind, boy. More so than your dad ever was. Obito teased Naruto as he stood back up. 
being careful not to step on the nearby winged scorpion seal. Naruto told Obito, you can't blame my dad for killing your first crush. Some things are out of our control. Even with his powerful Hiroshin and Jutsus, my dad couldn't have stopped Rin from asking Kakashi to kill her before she blew up. Rin's spirit had told Naruto about her life before she was brought to the Lord of the Dead to be judged. Liar. He could have given each of his students a copy of his valuable triple. Prong Kanai so that they could fly to their in-danger students right away. But no, he wasn't as fast as his flying thunder god technique made him out to be. Once I kill you, I'll be the hero that Minato Sensei failed to be, and Rin will never leave me like that stupid Kakashi made her. Obito calls up a huge shuriken because Madara had his signature gun by on hand, and throws it at D. Naruto catches the shuriken and then breaks it up with his cursed strength. Because of this, Obito gets angry and charges forward. The student and the yellow flash's son then start a full. On taijutsu match. Obito wasn't as good as Kakashi, but he was faster than Naruto. When Naruto worked in the palace many years ago, he trained with the Seti's Medjai and learned how to fight with his hands. Naruto was able to keep up with Obito thanks to his unusual strength and unique way of fighting. Obito, on the other hand, used his Sharingan to cheat by learning Naruto's fighting style by heart and making it hard to hit him by becoming intangible. Naruto realized that Obito would have to hit him in order to take away his power. Naruto knows what he's going to do, so he blocks Obito's hits until he catches the Uchiha's fist. When Naruto doesn't attack Obito but instead pulls them into the strangely styled floor panel, Obito is shocked. As dark mists attack the three, the scorpion seal with wings glows. Before their powers go away, the mists take them out of their bodies. Black Zetsu was lying on the ground. He had changed into a humanoid shape and could no longer melt and attach himself to things or living things. With his and Madara's dark pupils, Obito can no longer use the Sharingan or the Rinnegan. Naruto tripped and felt like a huge weight was lifted off his shoulders. There was no longer a home. Die curse. Naruto left Obito and Black Zetsu alone while he ran down the hall and stairs to finish his job. When Obito realized he had lost his power, he could be heard yelling in anger. Naruto also got feedback from his shadow clone as he went through the doorway and jumped over the crack that led to the dangerous opening of the duet. In order to wake up the sleeping champion of Anubis, Naruto rang the big golden disc gong. Obito and Black Zetsu had already reached the entrance to the Scorpion King's chamber. When the roar of the Scorpion King was heard, the room shook. Putting the gong stick away, Naruto pulls a pole weapon from an Anubis warrior statue. Each end of the pole weapon has a crescent moon. Shaped blade. He is ready to fight back if the Scorpion King doesn't take him up on his offer. As for the name of this weapon, I looked for it but couldn't find it. The Chinese monk's spade is the closest weapon that looks like it. Obito yells from the other side of the crack, What did you do to us, Naruto? Why can't we feel our chakra anymore? After the two big golden doors opened, Naruto said, It's because the seal we were on called forth a manifestation of the god of death. Taking away our powers so that we may face his champion as normal people. The doors led to a dark cave with something big hanging from the ceiling. As the shadowy figure moves, eight spider. Like legs cling to the walls, four scorpion pincers that can sever a man in half, three scorpion tails, and a humanoid body and head with black hair braided in a bun. His brown eyes were wide with anger. The monster, whose shape was still hidden by shadows, got down on the ground and used his big claws to open the doors wider. The torch's bright light on the huge monster's body proved that it was the scorpion king, Matthias, a former Akkadian warrior. Obito and Zetsu were scared and tried to get away quickly. Matthias's new body from Anubis, on the other hand, made him fast enough to catch them in his claws. Obito begged Naruto to save him while Zetsu spoke incoherently about mother and plans as he tried to get away from the monster. That's all Naruto said to Obito before telling him, you made this happen. It's time to meet the true gods and face those souls you've condemned before facing my parents and Rin one last time. When the Scorpion King drops Obito into a crack in the underworld, he screams in pain as the souls of the dead pull him deeper down and scratch, bite, and claw his skin. That meant Zetsu, as Anubis's champion, had to look at Kaguya's will with disgust before cutting him up and letting the pieces fall into the depths. It's too bad that Zetsu left a part of himself with Madara in case something happened to him. The part of Black Zetsu that is still alive will have to force Madara to merge with the Ten.
tails in order to bring Kagaya back to life faster. Once he's finished his job, the Scorpion King faces Naruto and then calls up his master's army to destroy the world. But the Scorpion King is shocked when Naruto bows down to him and then speaks in ancient Egyptian. Greetings, Matthias. The Scorpion King and commander of Lord Anubis' army. I am Naruto Uzumaki, High Priest of Anubis. Also named set by Pharaoh Seti I when I served him and his daughter in my time by the fertile lands of the Nile. I seek your strength and my lord's army to save my people. The gods have brought your oasis and the pharaoh's necropolis to my homeworld called the Elemental Nations. I no longer wish to bear the cursed power of the home. Die, but with your help in the army of Anubis I can ask Lord Anubis to free you from his services and you can live with my people. And explore this new world and experience a second chance at life. Naruto proposes to Matthias. But the Scorpion King laughed at Naruto's offer and didn't believe what a priest said. He was skeptical because he had been through tragedy and betrayal in the past. HMPH, what makes you certain you can fulfill your part of the deal? Will you accept any price Anubis will ask of you? He wanted to know. Naruto had a stomachache and something flew out of his body before he could answer. The light that came out of Naruto's body clashed with a black mist that came from the deep. Taking on the forms of two twin brothers, the two ghosts split up. You can tell them apart by their short, spiky brown hair and their long, wild brown hair and Mangekyo Sharingan eyes. Before another ghost showed up, it was their father Hagoromo, the legendary sage of six paths. They looked at Naruto with angry eyes. Before speaking, he looked at Naruto with sadness in his eyes. Since the wise man was just a spirit, even Matthias could understand him. Naruto Uzumaki, you have done the unexpected as the reincarnation of my son Asura. I had hoped that you and Indra's reincarnation, Sasuke Uchiha, could end the cycle of hatred together, and stop the return of my mother, the self. Proclaimed rabbit goddess Kagaya. Now the piece of black Zetsu, that Zetsu placed with Madara, will force Madara to become the vessel of mother who my brother and I trapped in the moon to stop her from farming humanity while keeping the power of chakra for herself. Naruto frowns when he hears that he was supposed to work with the Uchiha who wouldn't acknowledge or accept help from other people. For some reason that only humans know about, to bring peace to the elemental nations. Because he wasn't following the plan Jiraiya had made for him, he was sent away. And look where that sneaky pervert ended up. Then me and Matthias will stop her, along with those who are precious to me and will fight by my side. I get to decide what future I will bring with the help of the gods. You were told of the gods that govern this world that Kagaya refused to acknowledge, so she was punished, and you were given the chance to follow their teachings to help their creations live better. But instead, you decided to not listen to their wisdom and used your own wisdom to create your own religion where it only focuses on peace and connections. Naruto takes a deep breath before grabbing a closed scroll that held something that was left by his family. Luckily, all that was needed to open the sealed item was his blood, but not yet. Peace and connections are important, yes, but if you do not know how to defend and protect yourself then what's the point? It's also important to note that the gods are our spiritual parents. They gave birth to our spirits and created this world and our mortal bodies so that we can learn and grow from mortality than what being immortal spirits cannot teach us. They also made it so that we can still communicate with them, because children should talk to their parents when they have problems or are lost and confused. I think it's time you and your sons met one of them and finally move on. Your meddling ends now. Naruto swipes his finger across the scroll and opens the abandoned Uzumaki Shrine's Shinigami mask. The Shinigami shows up in all his pale glory, and Naruto puts on the mask. Surprisingly, another god shows up. Anubis, the god with the jackal head, stands next to Naruto, who is possessed, and the two of them stare at the three ghosts. My siblings and I have been lenient with you, Hagoromo. But no more. Chakra will still be allowed to be utilized by our children. They will need it, along with our gifts and guidance, when your mother's clan comes to try and drain our creations dry. Their leeching and godlike abilities will soon be put to an end as they are humbled and taste the fruits of mortality. It's time to come with me, Hagoromo. Or you can follow Anubis. Sama and face the scales of judgment. Either way the choice you do not pick will be Indra's and Asura's choice. The Shinigami granted the Sage of Six Paths his. Warning. The sage with three eyes gripped his staff in defiance as he went to destroy the Shinigami mask and send the Shinigami back to the star plane. He doesn't get very far because Anubis called up his flail and stopped the sage's hand. 
When Indra and Asura go to fight Anubis to free their father, Anubis drops his weapon and grabs the two brothers by the throats, using his clawed hands to hold them there. At the same time, the Shinigami has Hagoromo by the throat with his Tonto. It looks like the choice has been made, Lord Shinigami. I will lead these two to the scale and have their hearts weighed against the feather of Mayat. Hagoromo is yours. Anubis then threw Indra and Asura into the cracked ground below and waved his hand to close the crack. Not letting any other souls escape. The Shinigami cuts Hagoromo with his Tonto as he disappears into thin air. It was said that all the gods of the elemental nations would judge him at Kami's court. When Shinigami is done talking to Naruto, Anubis gives him the tool he needs with Shinigami's permission. You have done me and the gods a great service, Naruto Uzumaki. That meddler had been out of reach for too long. For that, the spirits that are inside my belly will be set free, and better things will happen because of their sacrifices. The Shinigami cuts his belly, and five wisps fly out to form the four Hokage. They then disappear in a beam of light, leaving Minato and Serutobi Hirazan smiling as they see Naruto again. The last wisp flies out to Joe. He then looks to Anubis and pulls out a golden scepter that can be used as a spear. Before taking Naruto's Uzumaki mask, the Shinto god of death ran his Tonto along the tip of the spear of Osiris. He then went back to Kami's domain to start Hagoromo Atsusuki's judgment. Naruto is then given the spear by Anubis. This is the spear of Osiris, it was destined to be used to slay my champion, but it shall now be used to end the life of the reborn Kagaya. I believe you wanted to ask me something, my high priest? Naruto asks Anubis. Yes, Anubis. Sama. I wish that Matthias may be released from your services and be allowed to live his new life here with my people while having the ability to revert to his human form whenever he wants. I also wish to only have my chakra back. I don't want myself or anyone else to suffer the curse of the home. Die. And if I am worthy my lord, I wish to command your army, so that I may end this war between shinobi nations and call upon it again when this Atsusuki clan Hagoromo spoke of comes to destroy all life on this planet. Naruto bows respectfully to the dog. Faced God. Anubis said as he walked toward the big doors that Matthias first came out of, I will grant it. For I have already been given two powerful souls. You shall not have to fear that I will take you against your will until it is your time. Farewell, my warrior and high priest. May Ra's light bless you and your descendants. He walked out of the room as the doors shut behind him. There was a solid wall with hieroglyphics that told Naruto's story in their place. Naruto turned to Matthias, who was now a full. Grown human again at 6 feet 5 inches tall. He wore a golden scorpion breastplate, a leopard leather loincloth, had tanned skin, and held a shield and kopesh with a scorpion design on them. He put the spear of Osiris on his back and picked up his old weapon again. So, are you ready to fight a goddess? Naruto asked. He smiles and flexes his muscles as he swings his blade a few times. Are you? Change of scene, demon desert. The Uzumaki alliance made Madara a little impressed. The Mizukage killed Kisame and claimed Samahada as her own. She also used her boil style to wipe out the Hidan completely. The young Keizkage knew a lot about the sand, but not as much as Uzumaki did before he lost his power. He was able to crush Kakazu's hearts and bury him deep in the demon desert's sands. The Senju was very strong and smart when she told the Shinobi, Samurai, and Medjai to kill thousands of his white Zetsu army. It's too bad she didn't have the wood-style power that her grandfather Hashirama did. But now he was ready to send the last of the Zetsu to weaken the alliance even more before he dealt the final blow when he turned into the Jinchuriki of the Jubi. However, Black Zetsu started to cover Madara's whole body and also the Ghetto statue, which hurt his back. Zetsu, what is the meaning of this? You are my will. You cannot defy me. Actually, I've always been Kaguya's will. I used you to do your bidding, just like you used Obito and the Akatsuki. But I can't wait any longer. It's time for the mother of all chakra to return and take her rightful place as ruler of this world. Zetsu disappears into the black goo as it turns pale, and the jubi is slurped inside Madara's bloated form. A beautiful pale woman with long, straight white hair and horns that look like rabbit ears takes Madara's place. He lets out a painful scream. She is back as Kagaya Atsusuki. She looks at the shinobi who have gathered to defend themselves with her by Akugan while the rest of the Zetsu form a wall behind their goddess. It makes her mad that Hagoromo gave chakra to humans who are starting wars. 
She has to start over so that she has an army when her clan comes to destroy the world. She has already built her garden. All of a sudden, something that isn't chakra rushes past her, and she opens her eyes to see that a big part of the desert has turned black. Aside from the sands around Hamanoptera, the Shinobi, and Kagaya and her Zetsu. As the black dunes fall, they start to shake and turn, and they end up on a flat plain. Until thousands of big bubbles start to form in the dark sands. These bubbles start to churn and squirm, and they start to shape into big, dog. Like, two. Legged beasts with golden armor and weapons that stand firm. Getting ready for something. As Naruto and the Scorpion King come back, that thing shows up in a swirl of sand. Being in front of the Anubis army. As Matthias gets the battle. Hungry jackals ready, Naruto walks forward. He moves away from Kagaya a few feet while she stares at the young man in front of her. We don't have to do this. Your son Hagoromo has finally passed on from this world and is facing judgment from the true gods. Relinquish your right as self. Proclaimed caretaker and sole wielder of chakra. You can't face your clan by yourself with just your drones. We can help you, and the gods can too. Together we can make a true peace that will last for ages. Naruto held her hand. The young person makes Kagaya tilt her head and narrow her eyes. They are telling her she is weak and not strong enough to look out for and care for the world. Before she speaks in a low, soft voice, she shakes her head no. Where were your so? Called gods when those warmongering humans killed my attendant and first lover? I had to do something to show that war is not the only thing you humans know. To honor their kindness they showed me, when I was cast out and alone. I shall destroy your beasts and undo the damage my sons have done. Kagaya cried out. He felt sad when he heard this. He body flickered back to the army of Anubis just as Tsunade, Ardith, Anko, Kura, Gara, and the other shinobi joined them and got their weapons and jutsu ready. Naruto raises his sword in the air with a loud cry, and the shinobi and Anubites join in to roar in the face of Kaguya's threats. Kagaya doesn't roar pack when she flares her power, which makes her zetsu double in size and number, and some of them turn into beasts that look like trees as they roar back. Matthias gives Tsunade a wink, and she rolls her eyes. They all look to Naruto to give the order. Naruto gets ready for battle by shouting, Hakuma Senti. Naruto, the Scorpion King, and the rest of the army of Anubis charge forward. Shinobi and Medjai are running along with them. The Zetsu react as the two of them charge at them. Kagaya floats back and stands tall, as if she already won. When the two sides crashed into each other, it was an epic start to the battle. The end. Kagaya was killed when Naruto hit her in the third eye with the spear of Osiris, ending a cruel battle that had been going on for days and nights. It was the army of Anubis that killed the last of the Zetsu and the rebellious shinobi from Kumo and Iwa. They crashed down on them like a dark tsunami and threw the pieces all over the place. He fixed up Uzushio and had it join with Suna so that the lands of wind and fire became one. With the help of a marriage to the Keizkeija's sister for political reasons. Mei Terumi also made a marriage deal with Uzu, but she let Kiri stay on its own. That crocodile is so sneaky. As the new monkey sage, Konohamaru, the seventh Hokage, began to rebuild Konoha and led it. He became known as the wise baboon of the leaf. Naruto taught him, and he was getting used to being in charge of Uzushio and loving and appeasing all of his wives and soon. 2. Be children. Including Kurenai, who was hired to help the Izukage. There was freedom of religion for Naruto, but the main religion stayed Shinto, and the other gods were respected. He kept practicing his Uzumaki and chakra skills to get ready for when the Atsusuki clan would attack. He was born to Ardith Bay and Shizun. His name was Horus. Horus grew up and became the new leader of the Medjai, which looked out for the ruler of Uzu and her people. Shizun's sensei, Tsunade, retired and learned some of the healing art secrets that Naruto had learned in a past life. He then became a famous healer. Also, she got married to Matthias. Together, they taught and cared for their two sons and three daughters. Naruto kept his promise to free the Biju. As soon as the Biju killed Kagaya, they were set free and given their own realms, which humans and gods could enter when the Biju let them. Everybody else left Naruto, but Karanitiri stayed by his side. She gave up her Biju title and became an Inari priestess. Along with the Uzumaki Empire, the elemental nations now have eight biju guardians to keep them safe from threats from other countries. 
putting together peace that will last longer than 100 years. So that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you. See you all in my next video.